DB AM. With Gillette, put your best face forward with our new and improved razors. All right, you're welcome along. It is Wednesday, the 15th of December. This is OTBM. It's Jaron Owen with you all the way through until 10. We have a very busy show. We're talking football. We're talking rugby. We're talking GAA. We're talking uh, transfers of players in different sports, uh, including getting the inside story of the Johnny Sexton move to Racing all those years ago. We'll talk about the COVID situation, but not too much, I promise. And uh, we might talk a little bit about what happened in the football last night, Owen. We might do. The Death Star is back. Seventh heaven. Magnificent seven. City of blinding lights is what the... So Man City beat Leeds 7-0 last night if you missed it. And uh, they're pretty good at football. There's my hot take for the morning. You can clip that. The job is done. That's the 200,000 views that we need. Uh, <laughs> it's it pretty much over, right? Uh, we've seen this one before, definitely. This is a, a, quite reminiscent of about 11 months ago, isn't it? When we were all locked up after a pretty depressing Christmas and realised that we were all going to be behind closed doors until March or April. That's when Manchester City went on a pretty incredible run last year and they just couldn't be stopped. And we're all getting excited about this three-horse race. But as a neutral on Saturday, I was a little bit nervous. And I, I, it's kind of hard to even tell where that was coming from because I want this three-horse race to happen. I want us to cash in on the grotesque capitalism that exists in modern football for us to actually get some sort of entertainment out of it. Like, yeah. Are um, you not entertained? Yeah, but exactly. Tammy Delaney on the show last night was basically... Uh, I don't know if I actually want to feel like I want to watch this all the time. I'm paraphrasing, but the... the Manchester City thing specifically? The, yeah, or? No, the City thing. It's like, yeah. they're just so good. It's like... But, okay. The thing with Manchester City is that it does reach in kind of a new point of entertainment once they get over goal five. And if the goal number five happens early in the game, you're like, okay, we're into record-setting territory here. The boring thing with Manchester City is when they go 2-0 up and then it's kind of like, will they get the third and it's 70 minutes and they start bringing on the bench and all that. That, for me, is more boring than last night where they get seven goals. They attempt 31 shots across 90 minutes. Not even close to the record. Manchester City has a record. 44 shots against QPR on the Aguero day. Oh, really? Yeah. All oh, right. Is, is apparently the record. Arsenal had 36 shots against Sunderland in 2017. Is another game. And, and Liverpool got close to that as well. And they had 35 shots against Swansea in February 2013. So City's 31 last night, not even up there. But you look at the game last night and you think to yourself, this Manchester City team are going to be the first Premier League team to score 10 goals in a match. It is going to happen. We are going to reach that high watermark. And it might have to happen soon. Who who are the potential well, fodder? Well, let's just, if they had Newcastle at the weekend, that could be a pretty big problem for Newcastle United. As it turns out, they do have Newcastle United at the weekend and I would be terrified if I was Eddie Howe so I mean Southampton are an obvious candidate at some point later on in the season of course. have they played them twice yet they haven't played anybody twice yet of course uh, so you would have to say that all of the teams who have flakily been beaten 9-0 at some point in their in their history so Palace and Southampton it, 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 it's there obviously yeah. <laughs> I mean is there maybe there's a cup game that they can okay it has to be a Premier League game is that what you're telling me well Manchester City against Southampton on the 18th of September finished nil all so uh, they didn't manage to do the business on, on that occasion. But uh, sorry, I, for for whatever, I, for whatever reason, I thought, oh, Leeds always get hammered by Man City, but they don't. So four points off them last year. Yeah, they have a really good record against them. So uh, I, I I don't know where I got that from. Um, was there a League Cup game that they absolutely United them or something? I can't remember. But um, or is it Manchester United? It might be. Like might Manchester be. United love playing Leeds. Um, the the. <laughs> There was uh, so I I was watching the Villa game uh, mm. in that first half, in particular the uh, watching the highlights this morning of the City game. After the first goal gets scored, the camera cuts to Bielsa and he's like, <laughs> <laughs> he's just looking down. He's just staring at the grass. He's like, uh, like, and I wonder what, what's he, what's going through his mind at that point. Uh, so, it, uh, Jim Beglin in commentary says, "Ooh, this could get nasty quickly," and I'm like, "Man, what?" Because they. they uh, in the commentary, they say, "Oh, City have missed a glorious chance just before this goal, and then the goal is kind of chaotic." Mm. And Bernardo crap. Silva misses an open goal before that. Okay, and uh, I mean, maybe the manager, his head dropping at it one nil, kind of somehow transfused itself onto the players a little bit. Is it possible? Well, I mean, obviously they were outclassed. They I, brought a gun to a knife fight. I, I kind of looked at it. They certainly did. I, I looked. No, a knife to a gunfight. Well, said he brought the gun to a knife fight. I looked at it and I thought to myself, Bielsa is just looking at the ground, thinking, "What's my next move? You know, do I do I look to my gilded bench and try and bring off players that per- perhaps even back to Spain, uh, back maybe to, to Argentina well, again, possibly wrap it up? He, he would. He would have. His bench was full of players last night that probably Marcelo Bielsa hadn't heard of himself. 
Uh, Leeds are, have been ravaged recently with, with injuries and, and their squad isn't great in the first place and Manchester City are obviously sensational but I, I did notice that myself as well I was like this guy's head is, has uh, has dropped but I just thought he was being pensive you know like if you pause again on Football Manager for a while go for a bit of a walk plot your next move that's what Bielsa was doing just on the sideline There's a chance they sink like a stone which would be horrible because they've been good in the Premier League and it's good to see them back in the Premier League but there is a chance they sink like a stone now uh, yeah, like I mean, in the context of the season, there is like they're on 16 points, they're five points above the relegation zone at the moment, but Burnley have two games in hand in them uh, who are in 18th position at the moment. I think there's a chance to get sucked in rather than dro- drop like a stone. And I think that there is, uh, I would not be surprised whatsoever if, if this is their season now fighting uh, for their own survival. Uh, like, I mean, they desperately need Patrick Bamford back, and it, it doesn't make it one iota of a difference in the context of last night but in the games that are going to matter for them over the course of the next little while. Uh, like Their fixture list is pretty, not scary, but I know that they've got Arsenal, Liverpool and back-to-back fixtures. Your beloved Villa after that. So Arsenal, Liverpool, Aston Villa are not necessarily the three fixtures you want to go with at the moment. And then their first game of 2022 is at home to Burnley. And that is when they need to, to kickstart their season, uh, potentially. And if they have uh, Bamford back fully fit at, uh, at, at that point and... and, and firing really uh, then they do have a chance because he's going to be absolutely central to them himself and Rafinha if if anything happens to the two of them in the business end of the season they will get relegated There's a good chance I think that they that they sink like us down at this point It's just that the second season syndrome and everybody has a lot of tape now on Bielsa and how his team want to go and Calvin Phillips is there for such a long time and doesn't seem particularly happy anyway Mm. Um, that would be disappointing if they do go straight down but uh, I think Norwich are going down after being beaten last night as well. They were bad. Like, I mean, you watched the game, but like, uh, certainly the two goals, granted, the first one... First goal I mean, was pretty good, but I, it, like, I mean... I've watched the first goal about <clears throat> 40 times now. Somebody has to stop him. Well, I can't tell. Is there a little bit of a deflection on the finish? Oh, I just think it was a beautiful finish. I, I, if, 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 if it finish, is, you can't like, take away from him. I, I, well, sorry. I, I'm not taking it away, but it did... It, like, but I'm saying you can take away everything else. I'm going to blame it on Norwich. Um, not take it away but you can, okay, you can blame it, a lot of it on Norwich but the finish I thought was sublime his feet were pretty quick um, screw you on I'm going there's a thing of beauty <laughs> <laughs> right he runs half the pitch which is yeah. which is true that is a fact he did run the pitch but it felt like he beat one man as he ran half the pitch he just like there were other bodies that he ran past for sure but yeah, he only yeah. kind of had to beat one man and then obviously the shot he had to be the keeper and it was a f- fantastic finish he turned a couple of people inside out um, I, 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 I like I know Ozan Kabak isn't um, considered to be a, a world beater or anything, but he he went off injured last night, and um, I thought he was good. I thought he's been good since he's come come back into the team. He's kind of in and out of the team for a while. I I think he looked like a good defender. Should have scored against Man United at the weekend. Yeah, and like they 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 were flaky last night, and there's a flakiness in a, in a team who obviously are bottom of the table and who've already changed their manager. Um, and he actually only goes off at half time but I think he got injured a little bit earlier and kind of tried to play through it um, so I, I don't know about Norwich but it's, it's bad that we're even like it has been an improvement from them that we're even talking about them in the sense of I don't know about Norwich as opposed to they're doomed because a couple of games into the season it was like record low and they're definitely going to go down and I think I, I think though that something like last night could break their spirit and they could finish not so they have 10 points at the moment if yeah. they finish with 18 points at the end of the season you'd be like not surprised no it's true and we're almost at the, the, the halfway point of the season as well 10 points after 17 games isn't exactly uh, a hopeful tally but there have been enough signs I think anyway over the last little while to suggest that, that they could get off bottom spot and then it's all up for grabs like I said this the other morning I do think that we could be in for potentially a cracking relegation fight as well as long as just one of those extra teams gets dragged into it I said it was possibly going to be Southampton the other morning after last night you probably have to say Leeds are the most likely candidate to make it a, a proper five horse relegation race but you need Norwich and Newcastle to be picking up points here and there so that everybody gets uh, brought into the mix talking like a real neutral here like as if uh, a team that you follow is like mid-table or just has no horse in any fight in this you're just look, looking at the top and the bottom hoping for some sort of drama well I think I think that there, hopefully there are three little leagues and there's the mini league for the top three and somebody stops Man City and they drop points again and there's just a little bit of doubt creeping in or something happens to make them I don't know it's very difficult to see that happening at the moment but um, in terms of the race for fourth right hmm. can Stephen Jarrett keep this up but you look I mean there's nothing but win or lose there's, I'm sure the first there's thing there's no did, draws I'm sure the first well that's a good point the first thing he did last night I'm sure was check the, the lead table and just see how, how far are we off West Ham again like 
and the answer is, is six points. Obviously, Aston Villa have an extra game played, but there is still got to play all these teams. Yeah, like the, the the problem is, it's just that the volume of teams between them and West Ham, and the quality, the potential quality, like Leicester City, Spurs, Arsenal, Manchester United, to to finish above all five of those teams, I think would be a, a massive stretch. But like Aston Villa finishing in the top seven would be a sensational return, no? Ah, look, it's, it would be ridiculous. Like, the thing is, though, they're, they're ninth at the moment and actually getting above two of those teams will be uh, a brilliant possibly, finish, yeah. possibly a stretch, yeah. Uh, so everybody is saying Stephen Gerrard's, like, excellent. Like, uh, it's difficult for me to judge because obviously, yeah. uh, you, you know, like a dog that has been kicked mm-hmm. by Logan Roy. Mm-hmm. Don't want to come back, but want to come back. Mm-hmm. So, uh, is he good? Yes, tell me. Yeah, well, like they, they, if you're if you're judging on the evidence of the last couple of weeks, of course he is. He's had a fantastic start as Aston Villa manager. They're in ninth. Like we said last, before he was appointed, that a top half finish would be an excellent return as Aston Villa manager. Because now it's like no, no oh, more than that. I, I but I, I do think we need to keep it in, in based in reality as well. That like a, a top half. But the reality is none of these none of these teams are any good. They're all flaky. As you chases. mean finishing ahead of Wolves, Brentford, and Brighton? No, I'm ever. talking about I'm talking about West Ham. To oh, an ex- you mean, oh, you're talking about Champions to, League. To an extent, Man United, Arsenal, Spurs, Leicester. They're the teams ahead of them. So let's... let's so, Roddy Collins mm-hmm. has called Ralph Ranick a spoofer. Yeah. All right? He says that. This is nonsense. He says he's amazing at PR. He's the type of person who gets belched out by the pro licence. Okay. It's very damning stuff, right? Yeah. Now, he's had some success at senior level, you'd have to say. Some success. Uh, but never with players of the quality that he has at Man United. What if he is a spoofer? <laughs> what if Roddy's right? No, nobody ever gets their articles brought up if they're right. It's always if they're wrong. So I hope that people who uh, are in the, the, the non-Manchester United School of Thought have saved this article and, and congratulate Roddy Collins at the end of the season if Randy does turn out to be a spoofer. The thing is, it's hard to sometimes decipher what a spoofer is because they're so good at spoofing that they trick you into thinking that it's not their fault but the player's fault. Yeah, and I guess the time off now, the enforced time off with... Covid from those matches, like is that be- so? Can can he get his stuff into the rest of the players? Is it first team player? We don't know. Do we know the players who tested positive? I don't think so. I yeah. don't think we know who they are. But they tend to keep it yeah. until the the match happens and everybody's like that guy's missing, and then yeah. it's, it's a kind of respect. But um, it's not like in American football where they announce before the player knows. Basically, <laughs> it seems like the test results are being leaked as soon as they happen. Uh, Maybe it's his maybe it's his first team who he gets to drill and drill and drill and drill for two weeks now mm. without a game. And that's like, well, you've had loads of time in the training ground and then and then we get to see him. Because they weren't good at the weekend. No, and they haven't they, they certainly haven't been overly impressive. Like I think that maybe he's talked a quite an impressive game and I don't want to lean too much into the idea that he's a spoofer here because I don't know like I presume he's an excellent appointment like not, maybe not an excellent appointment I presume he's a very good appointment and, and that they have done their due diligence on the guy and that he's not a spoofer you'd like to think that Manchester United have at least that in their locker in the hierarchy of the so club. who did the due diligence the same person <laughs> same people who hired and then you know they they 89 million on Paul Pogba that was a great transfer wasn't it Mm -hmm. I mean it was good for their social media it definitely worked out on that sense and it probably didn't cost them money on a on a balance over a period it definitely cost them in in terms of opportunity and culture yeah I I just think that maybe there has been a bit of confirmation bias going on in in the first couple of games where you know they've, they've won both of their Premier League games granted against Norwich City and Crystal Palace and those results have been grinded out and uh, yeah. they wouldn't have happened as a result of uh, if Solskjaer is in the dugout maybe I, I think that there's it's too soon way too soon to be making any conclusions as to whether or not Ranić and his methods are working at Manchester United because he hasn't properly implemented them yet his post-match comments have all been very interesting because as I say he talks an excellent game and he explains things in a way that Solskjaer never did that doesn't mean that he's a better manager than Solskjaer that's not an element that you look at to judge one manager o- over another but it just seems that uh, he has kind of given off this sheen of a, of a manager who is who is very very good, and that's what we that's one thing that we have to judge him on because he's played three games. He's no, like, Stephen Gerrard. No, Stephen Gerrard. Like, I mean, Steve, Stephen Gerrard is doing the, yeah, the one very thing good that job. the one thing about the Villa thing is that uh, over the last couple of years, there's been this kind of constant bubbling up of oh, they've got great kids coming through and they won a, an FA Youth Cup, and those kids are starting to make an impact at senior level. 
and that's unbelievably exciting because you never know how good they're going to be. That, mm. That's the best thing about being a sports fan is like this next group of young players are the best we've ever had. Yeah. Or they're, they're, we're not bored by watching them week in, week out. And at the moment, he has arrived at just a precise time where <clears throat> almost all his senior team, senior players are fit and they're all trying to bust a gut to make sure that they stay in the team. Ollie Watkins' form has come back and it looks pretty good. It's like um, I'm getting sucked back in. Yeah, and like players yet to come back as well. Uh, they, I mean, they're, they have always been not always, but like over the course of the last two seasons, they, they have been very, very good to watch. But that, that's what happened at the start of this season, wasn't it? That they kind of became a little bit more dour to watch, and that wasn't even at the start of the season because the first couple of weeks they were really, really good. It was just that period in what was in October. There's a where weird, just, there's a weird psychological thing them. that seems to happen in managers where they start second guessing themselves because he was like, oh, I, I, I got a couple of centre backs and I got all these extra forward players and I need to get them all on the team, mm. as opposed to saying you're going to have to earn your way into the team because my team is really good which would have created which is exactly what what Gerrard's doing he, yeah. he just dropped everybody who wasn't playing well and then their form came back because they tried to get back in the team and now they have to do what they're supposed to do like when Dia was good off the bench at the weekend he gets in the team it's like that makes sense whereas previously it was like I've spent all this money on him we have to sign him we have to, we have to play him so um, but managers second guessing themselves why do they do it why does it happen why do they go away from the thing that made them great in the first place uh, a reminder OTBAM brought to you by Gillette good morning start with Gillette put your best face forward with their new and improved razors we've got the sports news of John Duggan coming up right now Keen Tracy is going to join us for a roundup of all the rugby stories Johan Van Grand is obviously one of the big stories in Irish sport at the moment we'll get into detail on that with Keen at 10 past 8 sports pages at half past eight, a gift guide from Jess Kelly at 8.40. Finton Drury is going to talk to us about his remarkable career and life in sport. And then Matt Lawton is going to talk about the uh, curious case of the 100 metre champion. What's his name? Olympic 100 metre champion? The, oh, the 100 metre champion has disappeared. Yeah, what's his name? The guy from Italy. Here's a quiz question for you, Owen. The, the Italian 100 metre champion. John Duggan, do you know? Champion. No, I look his at the his phone, tried to Google oh, it. I was, I was, I deliberately took the whole of the Olympics off. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, had no in, I had no interest. I can't I, remember his name. No, I, I didn't watch any Olympics. Either. I listened to the piece I, last night and I've forgotten his name. <laughs> I, I watched Kelly Harrington's the only thing I watched the Olympics. That's fair enough. That's fair enough. But it's mad, isn't it? It was That was kind of the, the premise of the piece. Marcel Jacobs. Marcel Jacobs, that's it. John Duggan, good morning to you. How are you man, lads? Be well. Owen's just... Why can't I have that question for this week, Friday? You probably could still have it and I would still I, forget well, it. Well, it, would so, be a, it would be a crappy quiz question that I would get wrong, which would be a rarity. Ooh, the cat Ooh. Yeah. to start off the morning feeling himself uh, we've lost it we've lost to talk about where are we going to start well I think in 1998 Ister Brack went off a 3-1 to one favourite for the champion hurdle and it looked in, in hindsight it was one of the greatest bets in history because Ister Brack won by half the track and I know people who won a lot I know but somebody who won a house out of that bet and I just feel Manchester City for the Champions League a 3-1 to one this morning is a s- stone-cold great bet. Unless Pep Guardiola loses it again, which is obviously capable of happening. Uh, that is the, the caveat to it. But so, this is the thing, right? Like, like, they, are, they have everything. Uh, what about this number nine? They, like, Cancelo, uh, Jesus and Raheem Sterling weren't even involved last night. So what does he do, though? That's the thing, right? The team last night looked perfect. But what if they? What if that team gets picked again and they're not perfect? And then he's like, "Oh no!" And then all of a sudden, in a one-off game against, I don't know who, like uh, Liverpool, Atletico Madrid, do they make it that far? They're unlikely. A one-off game against Chelsea again. Does he pick the same team last night and have the confidence to go for it, or is it like, "Oh, I've got a shoehorn"? I just think, I just think it's going to come together for them. And sometimes it doesn't come together for you in sport. I just think sometimes it then comes together and people look back and go, yeah, well, City finally produced the form that they've been producing in the Premier League and the Champions League. And they have been getting closer, semi-final and now final. And they messed it up, obviously, against Chelsea last year with the defensive midfielder situation. I just think they've got too much talent. Like the like Leeds didn't help themselves last night, but it is it, the City have now gone seven games uh, in a row, won all of them in the Premier League and uh, I, I think Chelsea are beginning to it's like in the cycling analogy they're beginning to struggle a little bit behind the front too and I think they could get slightly detached It's possible that's our concern alright just one last point on this right you said they've got too much talent what if they have too much talent what if he can't decide what, what his best he, thing is that's, this that's season, the problem though, like, this season though he seems to be able to keep them happy like Grealish is happy they, they all looked happy last night 
just it, watching the game, they looked happy. Raheem, he, he seems to have had the balance right. Like Raheem Sterling was not happy, but he's fought to get his place in the team. Yeah, I, I, so I think the players could be happy, but he, he could get in his head again in a in two-legged semi-final against Bayern Munich, right? That could easily happen, where he just outthinks himself again. Well, he, possibly. Like, let's not forget that like not, not so long ago, was Pep was complaining about injuries and the pile-up of games and maybe a lack of depth and a lack of options, yeah, which obviously is awesome. hilarious. But like, does does he actually have too many options? Is is the thing? Like, have have he not? Well, what's his first team? Well, I think last night is his well, first team, with the exception of John Stones not starting at right back, and Cancelo comes back into the team. I think, that's, I think that's his first team. Gundogan's on the bench. Gundogan's on the bench. Is he? Yeah, Rodri, De Bruyne, Bernardo Silva is your midfield now. I mean, it's very attacking. Are De Bruyne well, and Bernardo as Silva as hard as enough as working? As long as outside Rodri, yes. as long as Rodri's, yes, as long as Rodri's in there. I think you're. Bernardo Silva okay. is hard enough work. I think sure. uh, they, uh, as long as Rodri's in there. Defensively, uh, I mean. Yeah, like as Bernardo as, Silva might be the best player in the Premier League at the moment, certainly in his form. Okay, so that, that's Although, your decision then. You've got one decision to make: Bernardo Silva or Gundogan. The rest of the team. No, I pick Bernardo Silva. Well, like, I, I think I think generally uh, Pep's decisions are around the front three, like who he, who he interchanges in the front three, because I think we pretty much know the first seven uh, outside the goalkeeper. Fair enough. Fair enough. I, I, I'm, the, I'm, like if you have Rodri and if he's that's fit, that's my only as, doubt about the three to one if, bet you're talking about. If, is if that if Rodri's at fulcrum and he's fit? I think that you're and De, like De Bruyne coming back or like in last night, uh, like a, like the player you'd seen oh before the God, Champions he's League. So good. Let me put the hand in the wound. I am doubting Thomas here. I need to like feel the bone protruding from your fleshy. It's like hip. Heliodrome, David Cronenberg. I think it more biblically, but uh, fair enough. <laughs> oh, uh, you've seen that one. I actually haven't seen that. Yeah, I. Just, I I'm kind of deliberately thrown in like, these 80s pop references know, every single time I'm on AM and it's kind of this a, is a for, yeah, I, could, I need to go to HR over this <laughs> uh, but to be honest I, I, that's all I watch myself anyway so there's, there's nothing uh, unusual about it okay, well, what's the, the touting Thomas moment? Well, what are you doubting? Pep until he wins the Champions League with City okay I mean look the Barcelona team he had played some of the best football we've ever seen they were also one of the most talented groups now mm -hmm. he was involved in creating the talent and allowing them to reach their fulfilment so I don't say anybody could have won the Champions League with that Barcelona team although other people did Yeah, his team was the best of those teams and he's trying to recreate a team who is the best of the teams as opposed to just the winningest of the teams and that is a very noble thing sometimes though Thomas Tuchel outsmarts you on the day because you're too busy trying to reach for greatness and you fall short I think the PSG game was a good example recently of how far they are ahead because they were really far ahead of PSG in that game at the Etihad you know or, or, or it just happens in a big final you've made it to the final the previous year you'd been knocked out by Leon. you make it to the final and Thomas Tuchel with a bloody good squad and with a bloody good football brain beats you that just happens I mean yeah. look at the rugby for example Leinster over the past couple of seasons arguably the best team in Europe and beaten twice by Saracens, beaten last year by La Rochelle, are you then saying that, are you then sticking the fingers in the wounds of Leinster? Or uh, are, are, are you... Well, yeah, I think with Leinster, there, there was a template that those teams had is that they had like absolutely massive bruisers who were capable of dominating physically and Leinster didn't have an answer to that. And that's the challenge then for them to come and fix. But those are the very small margins that exist at the top level of a... Of a continent-wide competition and I just think that that's, that that's what happened in isolation last year to Manchester City now you string the whole thing out a little bit longer and maybe you look at the Bayern Munich period as well and you start to think to yourself is, is there something that Pep does wrong in Europe post-Barcelona for sure but I still think in the context of last season they lost to Chelsea who were excellent and they had a new manager and they were still on that bounce and that, that sort of stuff happens uh, I would not be surprised to see them do the double at all over the next few months the important double, that is. Yeah, okay. They'll probably do a quadruple of meaningless competitions. Okay. Uh, so, Aston Villa, you've been talking about there. It, it seems that Gerard, like, you just walk in the dressing room, you'd expect the respect to be immediately there. And uh, even his press conferences, he's quite relaxed, which I've noticed. I uh, wouldn't have seen that at Rangers as much at the start at Rangers. And Michael Beale, uh, his assistant, seems to be very well got in the game. And it seems like there's a very good structure. And they're already having a 4-3-3. There's already a, a sense of the style and the consistency around what Villa are doing. So they're definitely very auspicious. And they've got very wealthy owners. And a brilliant collection of kids coming through. Like, absolutely sensational, who are, as I said earlier, maturing quickly. Uh, we're going to talk about Munster in a moment with Keane Tracy, as you said. Um, 
DJ Carey's comments in the Irish Independent here, and there might be other in other outlets as well about the shortened county campaign doesn't make sense, written by Conor McKeown here. Um, I just don't understand that we have the mindset that all Ireland final could be over in July and the rest of the year is given over to club action. I'd like to think I'm a very good club man myself. I've always been, but we're now rushing our main competition. We're fitting everything into half a year. Unfortunately, club players are browbeaten into saying we love the club. Of course we love the club and we'll always win. That's where we come from. That's our backbone. I just think the all Ireland series being over in July doesn't make sense to me. Um, what I mean is I'm not tuning into it. If Galway were playing Dublin or Cork were playing Wexford, that's what I'm tuning into. Or I'm at those games. We're putting too much focus in the club season that doesn't have the profile the inter-county season does have. I don't understand how we're not able to combine the two. I agree with them. I think there's a degree of piety from GA officialdom towards the club, which has an, an infallibility uh, in terms of the way you talk about it. Uh, it's obviously very important. It's the bedrock and the foundation of the association, but it does not have mass appeal. I was reading an article by Sean Moore in the Irish Times there, which was written two years ago, that the average attendance for club finals on St. Patrick's Day, which is one of the e easiest days of the year to attend something, was 27,500. And if you're ceding the floor to soccer and rugby for six months of the year, um, especially in next year when you're going to have football completely eclipsed by its uh, its its complementary uh, sibling hurling, which will have the round robin games because of this mess the, of the the G8, uh Congress where they didn't uh, change the football structure. I just think the promotion of the games. Well, like I was young lad, like the buzz around the All Ireland finals in school when you go back to school was a really big thing. I'm just worried from a, as a GA fan that they're ceding the floor to other sports that have mass appeal yeah. because the club game does not have mass appeal from the public. And just a, a minor aside on this, one of the points that John Costello made was fairly similar was that you lose the promotional opportunity around all Ireland finals in the schools, mm -hmm. essentially saying we won't be able to bring the cup to the schools when we win it in, in July. I was like, yeah. <laughs> it's true. Well, it's not. I mean, <laughs> when the schools come back in September, you, you, still, do bring your, cup. you still bring, you yeah. bring your cup. It's like, a fair point. I, I, I'm, I, I'm not sure if I, I if I agree with this because can I give you one more yeah, bit from, from DJ because there's other other good quotes here. Uh, Kerry stressed that even as a GA fanatic, the club scene in other counties was not of huge interest to me. What I mean is, I'm not tuning into it. But if Galway were playing Dublin or Cork were playing Wexford, that's what I'm tuning into, or I'm at those games. The the club matches like the 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 close run club matches, which are won by a score. People are, are definitely tuning into them and GA Twitter is alive with them, but it's the crossover appeal. It'll be yeah. interesting to see what that crossover appeal is. I don't think it's fair to judge just yet because uh, we haven't seen high summer matches um, between the clubs properly on TV and maybe when we start seeing those, the quality will go up. But the quality at the moment is it's 1-7 to 1-6. Mm -hmm. It's dire December, hard work, slightly violent. You know, it, it's not the best players the most skillful players rising to the top. So um, I definitely see the concern and I see the point of view. I just want to see this play out. I, I want to see, as you say, a full year, two years, uh, and let's see where we are after that. I think six months is enough time for an inter-county season. I, I think that's more than enough time for an inter-county season. The problem is not with the fact that it's been given six months. The problem is what you do with the six months. And you're absolutely right, John. Next year, hurling will be the dominant sport until we get to the real business end of the football championship. Nobody is going to care a jot about the provincial championships and the football because A, they're crap, but B, the hurling provincial championship is going to be amazing and they're going to be running concurrently to it. So that for me is the problem, as opposed to the fact that the season's only six months long, that we should be doing a hell of a lot more with the six months that we have, with inter-county football in particular, and I think we would have a, a quite a satisfying season. Now, he, here's the question then. Where do those six months exist? Could your club season run throughout the entire winter? Yes. And then yeah, you kick yeah, off your yeah, inter-county season yeah. from March to September. Yeah, but yeah. but then, it, does that come back to the idea of, is that fair on the club player? As you say, Jared, the, the 1-7 to 1-6, knowing that your peak times as a player, if you're not of inter-county standard, are going to exist solely in the winter time. Well, you know, maybe you could have league games and everybody does like a 20 league games during the summer where you're Well, playing. that should be the case. And I, I, and I think that is the case, in fair your county league should be running at the at the same time. Yeah, I would completely agree with you. Um, the, the the prime time of the year, the summer, uh, April to like April, May, June, July, August, September for the inter county season, and uh, because it's the one with the mass appeal, and that ultimately will get people who are who don't have an interest in Gaelic games to get interested in Gaelic games and then to join a club. Um, we should move on because the the FIFA Pro World Eleven isn't something that has been on my radar in the past. It's this is this seems like as big a controversy as that time that Owen picked Ronaldo over Messi for. FIFA. 
He's having the better season now. <laughs> <laughs> that was the first time he was considered a YouTuber, but not in a good way. Not as opposed to Japan, where I was like, "Wow, he's a YouTuber." I still think I have messy kids at my door uh, so often. That thing, I don't even remember what you did, but I just remember you picked. You picked did a draft. You left Ronaldo out of your. You left Messi out of your team. We did, the, the, you, you did exactly the same thing. It turns out. For anybody, for anybody who doesn't know, we did a draft, and we weren't supposed to do a draft, and we put up a team, my team because Ger picked Messi first in the draft had Ronaldo and not Messi and it got like I, I don't know 150,000 something or others something like that uh, but like there was a video of us picking our team which went apeshit in the uh, Messi Ronaldo Twitter sphere which is not a place where you want to go viral but the uh, point about this is that there's no Mo Salah yeah I, I, don't, I didn't even know what this thing was maybe I've been out of the loop as well lads but when you don't know what it is and Mo Salah's not in it and uh They've asked, prof- I'm reading Sky here, they've asked professional footballers to vote for the World Eleven by requesting them to pick their best three players during the 2020-2021 season. No Ederson either. Yeah, I don't know. That's a that's as egregious an error in my view. Yeah, it's, a stra- it's strange. Enough. Like, I mean, Alves, Alba, you'd have to maybe Neymar as well. Is there, is there even like a head of Lukaku, I know obviously he was brilliant with with Inter last season and that's a big part of this but I, I don't know No Salah is uh, a bit of a strange one Busquets sorry is up there as well isn't he uh, in, yeah, in the, the, the midfield the, section that's there was a, a thing a... on Twitter David Miner was asking people yesterday um, the most underrated footballers of all time or the man Busquets was one in my in my view it's definitely a good talking point I think the most underrated footballers to play the game well like I mean in the, the context of the fifth pro world eleven. You'd have to say uh, Mo Salah has been totally underrated here. Like the best player in the world right now isn't making the FIFA Pro World Eleven shortlist. Yeah, I, I, I wouldn't have been as I said on my radar the last ten years. And uh, the credibility of always all these things is always about who um, is not making the big errors. So here's the criteria to be specific. It's the eighth of October, twenty twenty, to the seventh of August, twenty twenty one. To be fair to the FIFA Pro. Uh, World Eleven. Mo Salah's form post the 7th of August 2021 has been better than his form at any other part in his career. So that's why he's been omitted. Yeah. Okay. So the last five months don't count. But, um, oh, so Jorginho is not it. Sorry, I thought I missed him there. Okay, all right. So that's nonsense. John, anything else going on? Uh, not really. Um, we got, obviously, Obama Yang Gate. Uh, that's just incredible stuff that he's now possibly going to be sold in January but who's going to pay 350,000 uh, a week for Barcelona come on down you know where are they going to get the cash from because it seems like Sergio Aguero is going to retire uh, today uh, sadly so uh, Mikel Arteta didn't become drawn on whether he would sell him in January but yeah he's uh, obviously made the change and uh, given Lacazette the captaincy didn't he the other day against Southampton so it's just it's it's amazing. Like like I think it's the lesson. Arsenal made the same mistake twice now with uh, Ozil and with Obama Yang about these big contracts. And uh, you want to be sure before you offer these big contracts um, that you're going to get the the bang for the buck. And they haven't got that, you know. It, it, I, th- I think with Obama Yang, there's a fair degree of bad luck about it. Maybe I'm being too uh, forgiving to the club, but he did seem like not only Arsenal's most important player by a distance when he got, gets offered the contract but possibly one of the best strikers in the Premier League at that point. Now, giving him that fat new deal when he was only going going to go one way maybe wasn't a, a bad move. But I'm sure they expected at least one more season of him banging in the goals with regular consistency. And he has just gone off a cliff since he put pen to paper on that deal. I think Arteta's done the right thing here. I think he's need to put the foot down. I will say in Arteta, in the case of, of Arteta here, it's made a hell of a lot easier because Aubameyang has been crap. Like if Aubameyang was banging in the goals and then goes on this trip and comes back late from this trip. Harry Kane. I think that's a Anybody? tougher, that's a, yeah, it's a t- much tougher thing for, for him to do. I think his decision was made a lot easier here by the fact that Aubameyang has been really, really bad recently. And I think it's the, the, he's arrived at the right decision here. Um, whether or not he was captain material in the first place, I'm not so sure because wasn't Mark Lawrence talking about his time at uh, Dortmund as well and how that dissuaded Jurgen Klopp from ever signing him at Liverpool. Yeah, and um, Tuchel, was, Nathan was talking about Tuchel talking about him this week saying he was always late for everything. Yeah. When he showed up, he was great, but he was always late and we couldn't rely on him to, to be on time. Um, why why do we know all this? Why is it all public? This is the type of... Is that just the modern culture everything's going to leak out anyway everything's going to leak out I think and I, I think Arsenal would, seem, would strike me as quite a leaky club mm-hmm. the, the only thing uh, yeah. Arsenal now they're the only opportunity to kind of like downplay this whole thing uh, I've seen a lot of people say is to 
release a new retro kit. But I think they came out the other day wearing uh, snazzy new uh, warm-up tops. So they might have already played that hand. There's no way out of this, basically, uh, on, on the Arsenal PR front. Um, but I'm not sure. I think I think Aubameyang, like I think that it's just the, the nature of modern society, isn't it? All the stuff leaking out as opposed to someone within the club. Is there a better way of doing it, though, than coming out and selling everybody everything? That's what I'm wondering. It, it feels a little bit like, oh, we have to tell you this horrible thing, and I'm, I'm really disappointed. It just feels a little bit like parenting in public. Mm. So we'll see. We'll see. All right, John, good All stuff. All right, lads. Cheers. Thanks a million. More from John, of course, on Saturday afternoon on Off the Ball on News Talk. It's five minutes past eight this morning. Cormac Walsh says a lot of teams don't have lights, so playing over the winter months is far from ideal and can be quite expensive. It's a fair point. And Jay Howard says Pat Spillane made a proposal club football and inter county hurling for the first six months and club hurling and inter county football for the second six months keep inter county games on TV all year round. Look, I think the thing is you just have to start making these changes analyse them with a bit of real-time data and information, see what the response is, and then move on, make the change. Like, if they move to minor, there's a massive campaign to get the move from um, under-18 to under-17 reversed, and we'll see if that's successful or not, but uh, it'd be good to see the actual empirical data on dropout and see if there's another way of fixing it before you go back to getting everybody playing again in under-18, because the reason that they stopped in the first place was all the pressure that the 18-year-olds were feeling with leaving certain exams, minor games, all that kind of stuff, the burnout that was such an issue for those those players. So um, let's just get the data and the information and then have a proper conversation about it. Uh, and maybe the, maybe it's completely obvious that the decision was wrong and then you go back and you, you revisit that. So very quickly, a reminder, OTBM brought to you by Gillette. Good morning. Start with Gillette, put your best face forward with their new and improved razors. A really busy show. We're going to speak with Finter Drury about his new book. Uh, after nine o'clock, Jess Kelly's going to give us a gift guide. Next, though, we're talking rugby with Keen Tracy. OTB AM. This is OTB Sports Radio. The Football Pod with Paddy and Andy, our new weekly Gaelic football show with Paddy Andrews and Andy Moran. I don't know, all these talks about kicking the sidelines with Mark Lynch, I don't think you can kick the ball as far with him like it's it's on to be honest. No, definitely Andy, that's a predator. We used to have Eamon O'Hara in with us, you know, with the club. Now, Harry used to come with the nicest boots of all time, <laughs> you know. He used to, like, out of the attic, boots of, a box of Adidas boots coming in. And all the young fellas, you should be like, where, where is he putting these boots on? So when Cunningham goes in now, coaching his first club team, <laughs> they're going to be like, where is he pulling out these new dance from? Download the OTB Sports app and subscribe to the GAA podcast feed now. OTB. AM with Gillette. Put your best face forward with our new and improved razors. So this week's episode of the Red 78 podcast was released just as the news broke that Munster head coach Johan van Graan is set to leave the province at the end of the season. For Quinny and Neve Briggs, outside pressure from fans expecting more success may have driven this decision. I think he's a good guy. I've had dealings with him. Um, very well, very re- well respected guy. Um, but there's, there's this expectation and pressure with Munster. And, and I have a feeling that Johan hasn't felt the love from outside the group, I think. From what I hear internally, the players, he's very popular with the players. There's a good good morale, even though they've had to take a lot of ups and downs in the last couple of years. Um, maybe it's outside, the outside influence and what Johan himself is feeling has made this decision. Um, the Munster fans are renowned for being wonderful fans and brilliant supporters of the team, going right back to my time. But they're pretty demanding as well and, and impatient, I think. And that impatience has increased in the last number of years, hasn't it? It has. I think I think a lot to do when you're looking across the, the province borderlines and you're seeing what Leinster are doing and how the type of game, you know, the game that they play. Um, it's It can be easier on the eye at times and... Um, and I think that, you know, from a supporter's point of view, you know, you want to you want to try and win as many trophies or as, you know, be up there with the Lancers. But I think to be fair, you know, this group of players probably this year, maybe, but and a little bit of last year. But I think that there was a, a time there when that group of players, you know, Europe has gone so tough. And Quinny, we've spoken about this so many times about how difficult it is to win a trophy, especially in Europe. And when you're up against the likes of the teams, the French teams that can pay a huge amount of wages and they can attract players from all over the world, um, it can be really difficult to compete with that. 
Yes, yeah, so that's uh, Alan Quillen and Neve Briggs in the Red 78 podcast talking about the pressure that Johan van Graan would have been under from the expectation of the fans. Uh, Keen Tracy, the Irish Independent, is with us this morning. Keen, good morning to you. Morning, lads. How are you? Um, this is a very interesting story, right? This, uh, you, you've got good detail um, in your piece about the contract. We were all like, oh, I wonder what's going to happen with the contract. Will he sign? Won't he sign? He had signed. He'd signed a two-year extension in the summer, apparently. But there's a clause that allows him to get out. Um, why do they have those clauses in the, these contracts? What's the point of them? Yeah, um, I suppose I'm no expert on employment law and in, in contracts, but I guess it's protected the employer as well that it has a six month break. If the employer wanted to release the coach, if say he or she was underperforming, um, I suppose the one thing you can say is it's the same clause that Pat Lamb left Bristol or left Connacht for Bristol in in 2017, and it's the same one that Rassi Erasmus left Munster as well. So. Unfortunately, Munster fans and Munster themselves have been down this road before. You know, like I mentioned in this piece as well, I think it's come as a major disappointment. I think the contract was actually agreed uh, verbally as far back as March of this year and signed in August. So Munster were certainly prepping and the RFU were, who were obviously central to the negotiations that Van Graham was going to be in charge until 2024. So this has come a bit out of the blue, to say the least. It's kind of embarrassing for the RFU then. Well, I mean, it, it keeps happening, but like, I mean, the one thing I'd say is they obviously have the clause in their contracts for for a reason. Um, what that reason is, like I said, maybe it's to protect them if a coach was underperforming. But I suppose the counterpoint to that is rugby isn't really like football in that you, you very rarely see head coaches sacked mid-season or anything like that. So, look, it's messy. Um I think, yeah, like I was doing a bit of digging on it yesterday. I think when you kind of read the Munster statement, you took it as face value that it it read like that he had turned down the offer of a two-year contract. But as it transpires, that's not what actually happened. Um, Van Graan is due to speak to the media today. I think it'll be interesting to get his take on it. Um, But from my information is that uh, his head was turned by a very strong offer from Bath. And that looks like where he's going to end up, which throws up all sorts of problems because it's not just Van Graan, obviously, who's leaving. Stephen Larkin has already confirmed that he's going back to the Brumbies. And my expectation would be that JP Ferreira, the defence coach, would go to bat with uh, Johan Van Graan because similar, I suppose, to when Rassi left, he took Jack Dean Arbor with him because he's his right-hand man, always has been. The, the two of them are double act. Van Graan and JP Ferreira are very much uh, cut from the same cloth. So Munster are essentially looking at at least three new coaches. Graham Roundtree, the forwards coach, is also out of contract at the end of the season. Now, I believe he has settled well in Limerick with his family. But, I mean, who knows? Like, I mean, it depends on who Munster are going to go for. If the new man wants to bring in his own people, Roundtree is obviously hugely regarded. But I suppose for a province who have craved continuity over the last few years, haven't had so much coaching upheaval, uh, this is the last thing they need is, um, even if they do have a few months to, to get their sort of house in order, they had been preparing for Van Grant to be the coach for the next two years. So in terms of like succession planning, it's yeah, it's just not ideal at all. No, I, I just like I understand that um, these clauses exist for a reason, but it does feel like if if a manager or a coach is underperforming, the association just soaks up the okay, we're going to pay out your contract, and we're going to pay you for the next year and a half, and it's wasted money, it's dead money, but it was because we made the wrong decision. That should really be their protection against something underperforming. And in in this instance, presumably it would only have been one year that they would have had to pay. It just feels like it's a bit one sided. And if it already happened with Pat Lamb, you would feel like okay, we've we've learned the lesson here. You're going to be tied to us, and it's the can't be a little bit pregnant thing. But I, I don't know. Just the, the way that the IRFU goes about all of its business seems opaque and uh, difficult to understand. Why, why wasn't everybody informed in the summer? Van Grand has signed up for two years and, and we're all confident that he's going to stay. That's the first part. And the second part is, would Larkham have taken the, the big gig if it was offered to him, if he knew that... I mean, I understand that there was a, a personal reasons involved in that too, but might he have been tempted by the big gig if he thought that Van Grand was leaving? I don't know. Yeah, I suppose the first part of that, why didn't they announce it? I, like, it's hard to gauge when, when provinces and the IRFU announce certain things. I mean, you see it with contracts it's more often than not. It's kind of when there's bad news in the air and they kind of drop it in then. I would have thought that they, they felt in no rush that he had signed on the dotted line and then the bath offer has come 
probably out of nowhere. And, and to be fair, like Van Gran has been was actually linked with Bath before he came to to Munster. So nice place to live. Uh, they I know they're absolutely terrible this season, including against Leinster last season. But they've got plenty of money there. Maybe Van Gran thought he had taken Munster as far as he can go, which wouldn't suggest to be the case because he had signed on. And Munster and the IRFU believed that he was the man to take them forward as well, which is probably another discussion point. But just on Stephen Larkham, yeah, like I think it's a fair question to ask, but I don't think that that would have been the case. Um, my understanding is that the family reasons are very much behind Stephen Larkham's decision to, to re- return home. Um I remember covering the story when he came to when he moved to Limerick in the first place. A huge priority of his was his daughter's. Um, I don't think his daughter, one particular daughter, has settled that well um, in school in Limerick. And I mean, you're in the middle of a pandemic. It's probably very hard to you know settle in at, at the best of times. They're a long way from home, so it's it's kind of easy to put two and two together with that. But I, I think Larkham's uh, heart was set on going home anyway. Um, and I'm writing. A, I wrote a piece in today's paper. You know what? Like maybe this clean break is is what all parties needed um, to push on to the next level. That would be my opinion on it all. It definitely does feel that there's maybe a bit more of a mixed mood around this than there would have been around Pat Lamb or Rassi Erasmus being allowed to leave the country. That there is a feeling that could the opportunity that this provides actually give Munster a better future than maybe another two years of Van Graham would have provided anyway. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more, to be honest with you, Owen. But clearly, Munster and the IRFU don't agree because they had they had tied him down to a, to a two-year deal. Um, I guess my view of it all would be Van Gran has probably taken Munster as far as he can. If we think back to when he came in in November 2017, I think a huge part of his brief was to steady the ship after Erasmus up and left. Similar enough circumstances, a bit more controversial, obviously, at the time. Um but you look at, like, uh, like he would point to Munster consistently getting to, to play off and knockout matches, but I would ask what Munster have actually done in them. Um, I don't think the game plan that he, he's been playing is the way rugby is moving. Uh, we see that even with Ireland at the moment, they're trying to change it up. I think we've seen signs of Munster trying to do it, but I think ultimately when it comes to crunch, they revert to type. Um, so... I don't think this Munster squad is caught out to play a South African type of game plan. I think, you know, I think Van Gran will leave very solid foundations for whoever comes in. You look at the Wasps game last weekend, the academy seems to be much more on track. Um, someone like Ian Costello has, has come in and done a superb job already with that regard. And even there's a sense that, like, you know, Munster being kind of reconnected to, to maybe what it was. I mean, especially in terms of the AIL. I don't think that that's a coincidence that it's happened since Ian Costello has come back from Wasps either. You, you look at all the young lads who played last week, they've been playing away in the AL and Munster have been keeping a very close track in them, whereas maybe in years gone by, it was just like, you know, well, number one, a lot of players weren't being released to play for them. So I think Van Gran has done, certainly done a good job in certain elements of, of since he's been in charge. But I just think this is a massive opportunity. Now, I, I wouldn't be doom and gloom about it if, if I was a Munster supporter. I think I think the opposite, a- right? Yeah, I think you're right. They're like it's an it's a, if they get the right person, it's actually exciting because, as Neil Briggs said there, like Munster fans are looking over at Leinster, going, "Jesus, they're playing great rugby and it's really successful for them." Why can't we have that? And it turns out they can have that because their playing squad is brilliant. Yeah, and I don't really like, like. I don't really agree with kind of the overall point that maybe Quinny and Eve were were making there. That you know the fans have played a major part in this. I think Munster fans are right to be expectant um, of this of this team. I mean, I know past history you can look back on that, but if you look at the quality that's within this squad, can anyone really say that this coaching team has got the best out of what's been there over the last couple of years? I would say no. Um, a huge, I mean, element of that like responsibility has to go on the players as well, the senior players, but. I just think Munster have been too slow to move at the times. Um, and that's been evident, like I said, any time they get to knock out games because they just kind of go back into their shell. I think there's been times where it's looked like they've been wanting to play more expansively. Even you think back to earlier this season in that Scarlets game, but I, I, I'm just not convinced that that's, that's going to be the way or even any sort of way they're going to play if they come up against a Leinster or a Toulouse in, in, in the Champions Cup. So... Look, I think you're right, Jerry. It, it all depends on who they go out and get. Um, this 
they have time to get it together, but it has put them on the back foot, like I said, because Munster were preparing for Van Graan to, to be there for the next two years. Um, like I said, there's very solid foundations there. Munster is always going to have an allure, like absolutely always for anyone, but it's about getting the right people. I'd love to see them be a bit ambitious um, with this next coaching ticket. Uh, like you think back again to when Van Grand came in, no one had really heard of him that much. He, he came recommended by Rassi Erasmus, you know, so um, you'd like to go out and see them get, you know, a really ambitious team. But I guess a lot of that will depend on budgets and who's available. And, you know, I'm sure we'll talk about it, but there's, there's no shortage of contenders, but a lot of them are under contract. But I suppose my argument to that would be Munster's last two coaches, Rassi Erasmus and Johan Van Graan, have now left while and they, they were, were under contract. Yeah, exactly. So why don't, why don't Munster go out and try and, you know, but if it's a Ron O'Gara, put an offer that they can't refuse. So Just to, uh, to clarify for, for anybody, it's actually going to be the IRFU making the hire and paying the money, right? So it's the Munster coaching job, but you work for the IRFU. It's one of those weird, you have you have to have a split personality while you, your, your fan base, our Munster fans, first, your job is with the IRFU. And so when they tell you that Craig Casey has to play a certain number of minutes and uh, Conor Murray has to play a certain number of minutes and the two young out has to play, you've got to do what you're told. Yeah, spot on. So like David Nusifora, the IRFU performance director, will be will be all over this. But uh, yeah, that's kind of, I guess, the way it's been for, for the last few years. And I think that's why maybe there's a little bit of disappointment, maybe touching on anger within IRFU level, because Van Gran has been, I would say, very obliging in, in terms of things like that. He's worked well with the IRFU. You know, Nusifora gave him a new contract when he still had a year left to run. So this has probably annoyed them a little bit, I would suggest, that he's had his head turned by Bath. But again, I, I just think there's a massive opportunity here. Um, I think like his contract was obviously up for renewal anyway, and all the signs were that he was going to sign on for two years. And like if I'm being honest, I was wondering if that was the right decision anyway. So, you know, maybe Munster and the RFU were going to get a, a get out of jail free card with this. But again, it all depends on who they go and get in. Who is the coach that is most in line with the brand of rugby that you would like to see Munster play? I mean, there's loads out there. It's, it's like if you're, if you're playing a dream team or whatever, like you'd say someone like Scott Robertson would be amazing to see come in. And you, you talk about great clauses in his contract. He's actually been honest enough um, and come out. And for anyone who obviously doesn't know, he's the Crusaders coach and was kind of, a lot of Kiwis would tell you was shafted for the for the All Blacks job and a lot of Kiwis actually want to see him in the All Blacks job instead of Ian Foster but he's contracted to the Crusaders until 2024 uh, but he actually has a break clause in his contract that allows him to get out of it a year, a year early if he doesn't get the All Blacks job essentially after the, the next World Cup. So the expectation would be that he would be the next man in but I think recent developments for someone like Joe Schmidt has just joined the All Blacks team. So for me, that change, that muddies the waters, particularly for someone like Scott Robertson. You know, is Joe Schmidt going to have his eyes on getting that job next? So I'd love to see them being ambitious, at least picking up the phone to, to someone like him. Um, I mean, you just have to look at the Crusaders' record. Obviously, a different kind of task coming to Munster, but it would be class to see someone like that at Munster. I mean, the obvious one that everyone's going to talk about is Ronan O'Gara. I'm just waiting for you lads to get him on the show to, so you can grill him to see what his crack is. Um, like, I feel like the time is right from a Munster point of view to do everything they can to try and get this, you know, dream team coaching ticket. You know, O'Gara is well settled in La Rochelle. O'Connell is well settled in Ireland. Mike Prendergast, you know, is well settled in Paris. But if they're not going to go out and get them now when there is essentially a clean slate, when is it going to happen? There's already been some suggestion that when the time comes, O'Gara could actually bypass Munster and go straight to the Ireland setup. You know, who, if Andy Farrell didn't stay on after the 2023 World Cup. So, well, can I, um, just, that's interesting to tease out because is is Paul O'Connell not the natural successor now to Andy Farrell? And so for him to go back into the meat and drink of the day and day stuff, day to day stuff in, in Munster, seems like it would be uh, swerving off that career path, particularly when he's getting so much credit for how well Ireland are playing. Like, it seems like, for both of them, it just seems like the time is wrong. I, I get your point from Munster's perspective. It's like, do everything you can to convince the IRFU to spend the money they need to spend. But for the for them, like, 
if if you plot this out, right, say, say the World Cup goes really well and Andy Farrell stays on, maybe at that point Paul O'Connell has to look sideways and go, all right, I want to I want to get a bit more experience. Or maybe if things go really well, then Paul O'Connell gets all the credits that he gets for that and he's part of a, an Ireland team that have reached the semi-final in the World Cup. That's where it would need to go for Farrell to, to decide that he wants to stick around or if he doesn't want the England job as, as it would be offered to him at that point because he's done a good job with Ireland too. So there's a lot, there's a lot there or you get stuck in and then you've got those, you know, it's it's a much different workload. It's a much different pressure. It's a much different environment. I don't know. I, I can't see that happening at the moment. No, I, like, I mean, I'm not for a second suggesting it will happen, but I just think from a monster point of view, they have to make the, like, the likes of O'Connell and O'Gara actually turn them down and say no. And with a realistic, with a realistic offer, I, like O'Connell has already been on the record as, and saying that, He's enjoying the fact that he's not in the daily grind of a club. He's got more time with his young family and stuff, and that's absolutely fair enough. And you're spot on, Jared. Like you look at the impact that he's had. It, it feels like he's actually been in the Ireland setup longer than he has. It's still only been a year. Um, he's a key man in that. But I just feel like you know, Van Grand has had his head turned by Bath. I just feel like Munster should do everything they can to try and turn their heads. I would agree. I think it's still a long shot um, in terms of happening, but I, they just have to they have to go out and I, I think do everything they can. I think the thing about Munster at the moment is as well, it's probably worth mentioning that there, there's so much other, so many other issues. Like you, you think of that they're going to probably need a defence coach now, but also like in terms of player recruitment, like there's a lot of contracts um, up at the end of the season, including the likes of Damien Dielende and Orgy Snyman. Like, what does the future hold for them now? I know they obviously signed for Munster as a club, but Van Gran was the man who brought them in. Um, I think that, that their futures are very much up in the air. You know, if Munster are looking at potential new signings, who's the one signing them? Or like, what sort of project are the players signing up for? So I think it puts them on the back foot in, in many aspects, to be honest. It, 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 to, to deliver maybe like a bit of a glass half empty view on Munster's prospects over the next little while, you mentioned Johan van Graan comes in as, as a relative unknown to the Munster job, doesn't win anything with Munster, Munster can't keep a hold of him and goes to Bath. How can Munster then expect to attract the cream of the crop if this is what's after happening to a coach who comes in under the radar and actually doesn't win anything? And, I mean, we're seeing a reaction coming in this morning, I think you've alluded to it yourself, Keen, this morning, that he hasn't, didn't do a great job uh, and it still seems that there is a sense that Munster have lost hold of this guy. So how how can they really set their their targets so high when this is what's after happening? I guess like to play a devil's advocate, they would argue that the, there's solid foundations there for for someone else to come in and build on. I would agree. Um, I think like Van Gran is really well liked by the squad, and that was one thing that people had said about him before he came in. He was best man. He was best man at a couple of Springbok weddings and things like that. I think his man management and even I think back to how he managed this sort of the Joey Carberry situation he was coming back from injury is second to none but like you look at his record and if we're being honest and we take the emotion out of it it doesn't look great that a guy who hasn't been able to deliver silverware has essentially turned his back and changed his mind on Munster um, I mean in hindsight Munster maybe would have preferred to got out in front and said look your contract's up at the end of the season. Thanks very much for everything you've done. We're yeah. going to move in a different direction. But that, and that's a little bit damning, I think, because Munster wants to continue on this uh, trajectory, which goes back to one of my initial points. Like I think there could be this could be a blessing in disguise. I agree with you. I, I uh, Johan van Grand. It's been Grand, right? It's <laughs> been it's been fine. I like the when you when you talk about the good base to build on. Like he had a good base to build on. Razzie had actually set, steadied the ship a lot and and had made it a more attractive job. Like, Razzie was one of the big names in world rugby and we all knew he was going to go to South Africa if they came calling because that's where his heart was. And like that was the right thing for him to do. With this, it was like a completely unproven, brand new coach cutting their teeth. There's every chance that he goes on to become a Warren Gatlin figure and learns a lot and has soaked up a lot from this environment and goes... And and isn't isn't pay, isn't uh, working for two paymasters? It's Bruce Craig, and that's it. Like I I don't know. I I think that um, it's a big opportunity for them, but I think it's a bit of a shit show from the IRFU, where they've signed somebody up to a two year deal and they've given him the opportunity to walk out six months later, and he's done that, and now they're scrabbling for somebody where there's no natural successor within the squad, and I don't know. Maybe maybe somebody from the Ireland coaching ticket is there. Maybe 
maybe they look at Easterby and say this is your time maybe they look within the other provinces and say there's somebody there who we're going to give a, a full coaching ticket to but again it's not obvious it doesn't look like they have a plan and I, I think this all goes back David Yusufora gave this guy a contract now the contract has a clause in it somebody's waved a checkbook away he goes who's responsible for this and who's holding David Yusufora to account for it nobody yeah, I guess you could probably say that about a, a couple of remits um, in that job. But yeah, look, you're right. I, I don't think there is a plan in place yet. Um, Munster might argue otherwise. But I mean, I don't think, you know, sometimes when when these kind of things happen and the coaches leave, there there is an obvious person waiting in the wings to step in. I don't think that's the case. Even you think back, like you think about Stephen Larkham, obviously his decision has been announced uh, a few weeks now. And there hasn't really been any word about, you know, who might be, been a couple of names thrown around, but absolutely nothing solid yet. So um, I think there's there's other questions to ask. Like, if you remember when Rassi Rasmus came in, he came in as a director of rugby initially. Um, and then, you know, circumstances dictated that he became the head coach. And when Johan van Graan came in, and you're right, Jerry, I think that kind of gets forgotten about as well, that, he had never been a head coach before, so Munster took a massive chance on him. But when he came in, it was as head coach, and you were kind of wondering why Munster ditched the idea of a director of rugby when it seemed like that was the route they wanted to go down. So I think it'll be interesting to see whether they look for a director of rugby type figure um, as their next appointment or if it will be a hands-on coach because there are there are pretty big differences um, in the day-to-day the running of, of a club like that. So... They've got a lot of things to, to figure out, but like I said, they've been caught off guard here. Yeah. I don't know, there's been grumblings over the last couple of weeks, but um, apart from that, Van Cran was signed up for the next two years. That director of rugby model is essentially what Leinster have, although the titles aren't... But, but Leo Cullen effectively is director of rugby and they have a head coach in uh, in Lancaster and it works brilliantly and you can see how Lancaster is obviously uh, a massive name whenever any of these jobs come up in England because he's doing such a great job but maybe maybe Munster should look for that and Munster should look for that director of rugby to be a Munster employee who has Munster at heart and that's the gig and I know that that would cause a bit of tension with the IRFU but there's no chief executive uh, in the IRFU at the moment and now is the time perhaps to to get that and kind of reassert themselves and reassert their, their position. I, anytime I talk to people, I have a tendency to get a bit of Stockholm syndrome. We had Jerry Flannery on the show recently, and I was blown away by just the the level of uh, second order thinking that he has about stuff. And he has now got a bit of distance from the situation. I can see him being a brilliant head coach at Munster at some point. It might be too soon, but maybe it's not. You know. But there's no that that's the thing. There's no shortage of guys like Jerry Flannery. You know, we've mentioned Ron O'Gara, Mike Prendergast, someone like James Collin, even someone like Jason Holland. I think is going to be an interesting one with the Hurricanes. Um, I was actually watching a, a video he had done with New Zealand TV a few months back, and even then he spoke about you know kind of one day wanting to come back to Munster. Uh, obviously he's contracted with the Hurricanes until 2023, but someone like him would be very interesting as well. And your example of Leo Cullen and Stuart Lancaster is spot on and even there's been sort of word this season that Connacht have kind of gone a similar type of way not not exact same in that Andy Friend has taken a slight step back to have a more kind of helicopter view of uh, what Connacht are doing so it seems like that's the way Irish rugby wants to go um, so it, yeah it'll be fascinating to see if Munster if Munster do it because I would agree. I think it would be no harm to kind of have a, a monster voice. Like there was a lot of talk when Van Grand came in that I we're pretty sure it was the first time in the first time ever that Munster didn't have um, a homegrown coach on the on the coaching staff at all. So um, I'm not saying that it has to be all monster men or anything like that, but I think it would be no harm to have a voice like that because I think we're already seeing the benefits of that in what Ian Costello is doing with the academy who's monster through and through Alright King good stuff thanks for joining us this morning plenty to get it, uh, stuck into and we didn't even get into the, the RFU and the relationship with the women we will be covering that again in more detail soon thanks a million Keen. cheers cheers lads it's 8.34, OTBAM is live in association with Gillette. Good morning, start with Gillette. Put your best face forward with their new and improved razors. Uh, there'll be plenty of applications, says Kieran O'Connor, and Van Graan wasn't doing that well. I don't think Van Graan leaving will be as big of a disaster as it looks if they get someone ingrained in Ireland already. It will be positive, says Doombot36. So, not living up to his name, Doombot. I, I don't think it's important that um, 
somebody is Irish, I think it would be hugely beneficial if they were. But if they're best coached, if yeah, I think it's unlikely they're going to get Scott Robertson. But if they were to get him, you know that it's somebody who's going to be there for a short period of time. And you would hope that the succession plan is in his backroom team and they find somebody who's simpatico and who has the potential to to grow into a, a head coach but that would be nice yeah but uh, like there is a possibility and I don't want to be too negative here but there's a possibility that the rest of the season is kind of a little bit wasted for Munster like unless of course unless the players really do this for Van Gran and they get over the line and for Larkham and it leads to some sort of silverware and that's the motivation they need of, yeah. of course that, that wouldn't be a waste but I'm, I'm just worried that you know the same thing happens as the past couple of the seasons. They, they lose to Leinster in an important game at the end of the season. They lose a, a, a Heineken Cup quarter final, maybe even a semi final, and it's the same result without finding out anything more about your coaching staff. Because larkham has gone, he's not going to be the successor, and Van Graan has gone. Give a Giggsy till the end of the season would almost be a better sort of option to find out whether or not the Giggsy guy is actually the, the person. We're not going to find out anything more about Van Graan uh, or Larkham over the next little while because they're out the gap. Um, so again you need to have that person in situ I think their CVs would definitely benefit from success this season it would transform sure, yeah. their next job it was like oh you delivered silverware of against course. all the odds yeah, so like, there, there is there is a, a symbiosis there that would that would definitely benefit Munster um, Jerry Thorny had in, uh, interesting information in his piece today he, he thinks that there was there are doubts around the contracts for the two South Africans in particular and that that might have fed into his desire to leave that there there's uncertainty around um, re-signing uh, Dialende and Snyman. Dialende is expected to move most probably back to Japan. Snyman, I, ca- I can't see anybody in the Munster hierarchy saying, yeah, sign him up for a th- year three. You just can't do it. You've got to cut your losses. That's It's a hard, cold reality, but this is a player who you've brought in on a massive money to play for the team. He's been unable to play for the team. The best ability is availability. He's been unavailable. I'm really sorry for your troubles go off and somebody else will pay you the money because you're going to be sensational I know you're going to be sensational you're going to have a great career afterwards mm. but we can't we can't afford to do that and also you're an opportunity blocker to the kids yeah yeah the best ability could be being 6 foot 10 and uh, the ability to show some grunt in the, the pack as well Like so I, I can see the temptation to, to, to keep him around we, have, we haven't even seen Jason Jenkins yet actually the, the other opportunity blocker that was so I think he's trapped in South Africa at the moment isn't he as part of the the <laughs> Covid lockdown, um, like so, it'll be interesting to see how that one plays out. But there is definitely, there definitely has obviously been a South African tint to Monster over the past few seasons. It'll be interesting to see does that now dissolve over the next little Hopefully, while. Hopefully, yeah. <laughs> Hopefully, right. We'd like them to be Monster. We'd like them to be the Monster 2.0, whatever that is. Like I mean, the, uh, some of the kids in the pack the other day didn't look too bad. No, they look brilliant. Yeah. Like that's the thing. It's like it looks like it's a bit like the Villa job. It's all set up for somebody to come in and just immediately go, right, this is what we're doing, this is our identity, no ifs, ands, or buts, we're fully signed up. And so O'Gara would be brilliant for that, or O'Connell would be brilliant for that, but I don't know. I mean, I would love that. And O'Gara, O'Connell, Mike Prendergast, Colin, dream ticket. Yeah. How good would that be? Yeah, yeah, no, like, I mean... It, 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 that, that is the dream ticket but it's all about timing and, and where these guys actually want to go like I'm sure you're asking Villa reference uh, I thought you were going to like deliver a gut punch to all the Munster fans watching this morning being like both European Cup winners in ancient history or something like that no but, no yeah. Owen screw you I'm like uh, like brilliant youth coming through yeah, okay. seasoned veterans who are ready just need a little bit of leadership have, have lost their way a little bit I mean yeah. I don't think they even have lost their way this season they're going all right yeah, there's a, there's there have definitely been moments over the past couple of years to suggest that they're going in the right direction. Actually, it's just the thing that's killed Munster is the big games and the the knockout games. Leinster have constantly been the thorn in the side in the big games and the the URC or the Pro 14 or the Pro 16 and then Champions Cup knockout games. So it's again they're they're in that part where they're they're in a thin line between success and and, and failures of seasons. Okay, it is eight thirty eight this morning. If you want to get in touch with us, we'd love to hear from you. Oh eight seven nine one eighty one eighty is the WhatsApp number. You can leave a comment on the YouTube stream. We'll get to all of those in just a couple of minutes' time. Um, a reminder, of course, that uh, you should generally use the OTB Sports app. We are still having some difficulties on the iOS platform. If you're listening on Spotify on iOS, or if you're listening um, wherever you get your podcasts on iOS, we're having difficulties at the moment and uh, oh there's an extra mic live there I think um, and you can set your podcast to download they will download for you it'll take a little bit of time but you should be able to get them through so uh, that is the crack with that um, right uh, this week's Koi Gig Pod Kathleen McNamee was joined by Republic of Ireland manager Vera Pau 
an unorthodox coach to some in that she lives abroad while managing the national team here. She explained how that works best due to the excellent underage coaches taking care of the development at grassroots. No, it's a national team. It's top sport, so it's about the best. And we have fantastic coaches um, uh, like James Scott, like Dave Conno, uh, like Tom Elms, who was the under-16, um, and um, Richie for the under-15. We have enough coaches who are constantly taking care of the development of the players. That is not my task. My task is taking care of the best um, and making sure that the best players get the best facilities. And that is what I'm, I'm, uh, I'm dealing with. Um, the de youth development, it, we have full-time coaches for that and they are dedicated to it and they're highly professional and highly educated to do that. That doesn't mean that I, mm. I'm not part of it. We discuss everything, we discuss all the development of the players, but they are appointed to guide those players to the higher levels. Mm. And how would you describe your style of coaching like when you were if you were to put yourself into a coaching characteristic you know you have so many different types for you how would you describe your style of coaching oh that is difficult because i relate my coaching to the ones in front of me um for example when i was coaching the netherlands i had to be very strict and 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 with um with a team building process outside the pitch uh, because nobody saw us standing. Um, they were only looking for the negatives. Um, the players were purely amateurs when I uh, started coaching there. Uh, they, they called themselves top elite players with only training twice a week. Um, they um, had never gone to a final. So that was back then in 2004 a complete different style because i had to teach them what it is to be an elite player here the maturity is much bigger so there's a lot more freedom for those players um, and they have a lot more um they can bring in a lot more because their knowledge and their experience in the game is so much further than when i started in the netherlands um, and therefore, their opinion um, is um, related to more experience and more knowledge, so have more value to bring into the coaching. So I give a lot of space to players uh, and, of course, to staff um, to influence me uh, in the sense of what is good for this team, how do they feel, because they are the ones, the players are the ones who need to execute it. So if the players do not uh, feel and with arguments do not feel why um, why they not comfortable with something they were looking together in what is is suiting them and we always come up with a system that's most comfortable for the players okay. uh, Republic of Ireland manager Vera Pau on this week's Koi Gig pod on OTB Sports in association with Cadbury FC official snack partner to the Republic of Ireland women's national team that full episode is available to podcast right now and every Tuesday on the OTB Sports app you can watch it back on the Off The Ball YouTube channel as well. Jess Kelly, tech correspondent for News Talk, is with us. Good morning to you, Jess. Hi, how are you? We were just gossiping there in the middle of that about the impact on uh, Peloton's share price. This is a spoiler alert for any of you who are... What's it called? Sex and the City. No, it's not called Sex and the City. Oh, just like that, and just, just like that. And just like that. There you go. So it's the Sex and the City spin-off. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a spoiler alert. So if you're, if you're mad into it, you don't know what happens. No, I don't, but I heard that there was a big twist and Peloton was involved. Have you heard of Sex and the City? Let's just clarify that. No, what, is, what is Sex and the City, uh, Jess? I've never heard of this I TV show. I don't know either, but a lot of people have been going pretty wild about it. You need to, you need to go to the 80s if you want. That, that's the theme on this show, but uh, I guess you are younger than John Duggan, so unfortunately you're not... Uh, I'm sex much younger than... Yeah. I'm, not, I'm not that much older than you. I know. He thinks that he's on your side. I'm on, yeah, I'm on your I, side I here. Like, Jesus, okay, no, I'm don't just throw the me person, under the, the bus. The person that's Early exposed the to the like an 80s reference. And, uh, yeah, we yeah. humiliate Owen with references to the 80s, but you're doing it now with, uh, with the early, early 90s. It's even more humiliating, to be quite honest in with you. Very late oh. 90s. Very what late is? 90s. 98, because it's the same time as The Sopranos. They're, they're, um, they're simultaneous, massive outpouring of success for HBO at, at the same time. Um, they were their kind of two hit series that both have managed to survive in pop culture, although you would have to argue that Sopranos, Sopranos is far is better. Superior. Yeah. Uh, anyway. Hot take. Do you know, did you watch any Sex and the City? I, no, I haven't actually seen ever. Sex and the City ever, no. Really? Yeah. All right, so you know Carrie Bradshaw is the star. Yes. Right. She, so she has a long on-off relationship with a, a, a good guy, 
Aiden yeah. first, but then they ditch him for a complete scumbag who's oh. called Mr. Big, right? Yeah. So Mr. Big is in the new series, and they're oh, like, oh, they comeback. survived, they're still together, that's amazing. And then at the end of the first episode, he dies. Oh, spoiler is right. On his Peloton. On his Peloton. <laughs> and immediately, now I haven't seen this, but immediately the share price is like, <laughs> dead. Just like Big. But, <laughs> but they tried to redeem it so very quickly. So Ryan Reynolds, the actor who plays Deadpool, he's a very funny guy. He also has his own uh, marketing advertising thing outlet. Uh, they jumped on this and they filmed a spoof of it featuring Mr. Big. Now, I don't know if it's actually repurposed footage from the movie or if it's something they shot differently, but it's Mr. Big talking to one of the actual Peloton instructors and talking about how great Peloton is and how great cycling is to keep you fit and healthy and well. So they're trying to like redeem it after killing one of the most iconic characters from 90s TV. I mean, I have to say anybody who's selling Peloton shares on the basis of a fictional character dying is like, what? Yeah. But cycling is good for you. You're like, you know this. I, this doesn't make any sense to me. I presume you bought Peloton shares and after the big drop. Well, I mean, they, they haven't come back. So they were at $54 on Tuesday, the 16th of November. Mm -hmm. And they're now at like $39. That could be a good Christmas present by yeah. their loved one 10 shares. And that is billions wiped off because of this bullshit, I think. And uh, it's also the sentiment. It's all like, because this is the annoying thing about how, and not to bore anyone, but that's how advertising agencies work now is they track the sentiment towards the brand. The brand could have done jack all in terms of changing what it does, how it works, how it operates, but it's the perception and it's the mood of the consumer. So basically, little bots crawled across Twitter, saw people were losing their tiny minds about this, and as a result, the price drop um, happened. So they're trying to redeem it now. I don't think it's going to be a permanent thing. I also think it's a certain cohort of people that actually care. There's a smaller cohort of people, again, that don't understand real life from fiction. So I think it'll all be okay. Uh, like, I mean, why are, like, is this always a, a theme of Sex and the City where they kill off meaningful characters in a Game of Thrones style? See, I haven't watched it, but didn't one of the four wands from Sex and the City not take part in this? Oh, yeah, yeah. She, did, she They've had massive uh, uh, offset, uh, off screen rows. Um, so she was killed Kim, off as well. Kim Cattrall. No, she's moved to London. Worse. Oh. Okay, God. She may as well be dead. London. Jesus. <laughs> Who wants to live there? They're eating out of bins. Uh, <laughs> Uh, okay, so I must uh, must must watch this then. Like, I mean, so Peloton uh, basically is is dangerous. Is is what it's not. Sex and City is telling it's us. not. That is not the message from our, our yeah, slot it. with tech. No, he had genetic don't car conditions. Sue me I think Peloton. Is. I said nothing. Uh, I, I, I mean, if they want us to have one in the studio here, we'll demonstrate how they're great. Yeah, I don't I mean, have one. But, those um, ads always look great. I always want to just get up and you go guys at are the day. shameless. Anything that gets mentioned, you're just like, oh yeah, we'll have one of those. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> but I mean, we've we've those, yeah. this is our third attempt at doing this gift guide. We haven't got one thing free yet. Yes, of course. We're shameless. This is dreadful. Give them free stuff, please. <laughs> what uh, What have you got for us? Well, I have something actually that you can have, and it's like a poor man's Peloton, which I'm sure the brand won't like me t uh, referring to it as. But it's a so <laughs> <laughs> professional reviewer here. Uh, What's it the tagline: <laughs> a poor man's Peloton, and share price goes up. <laughs> Watch as I never work again. Uh, this is a smart skipping rope. It's by a brand called Tangram. It's 50 quid. It's from 3.ie. And the idea is that it pairs to your phone with an app and it will count your skipping progress. So if you have someone who's into their fitness, who doesn't have the money for a Peloton because they are still super expensive, 50 quid, stop laughing at me. This is the way for you. So Owen, happy Christmas. Oh, thanks very much. That's for say, you. Jess, have you ever met Owen Sheehan into his fitness is not one of those things that Sorry, we describe. Sorry, I had to, apolo like I had to issue an apology last week because I referred to Owen as not being an athlete. But she said that like Apple Watches are could be great for you because you're not necessarily uh, very athletic. <laughs> <laughs> She's right, though. <laughs> well, I had to issue a formal apology, so there oh, you go. Oh, on, this show, on this show over the last couple of years, Owen has uh, remembered how to cycle, kind of learned how to cycle, and then learned how to swim, and then both promptly forgotten how to do both. The, the pandemic killed my swimming progress. Can you skip? I can skip. Okay, what is it called? Rookie, is it? Yeah, which is pretty apt. There you go. Nice. There you go. What are you, a complete rookie? Yes. Uh, it turns out you are. And... Um, Thank you. You're, You're you, welcome. I'm going to not re-gift this. I'm going to use it. I think you need to do like an Insta vid or a Twitter oh, vid yes. proving yeah, it. This is, this is his breakthrough in TikTok. Yeah. I, I'll review, Rookie. No problem. Excellent. Thank you very much. Pleasure doing business with you. Um, I mean, we, they, they, we, we could have a campaign with them, right? Like, there's a, this would be on brand. Please stop doing this. <laughs> I'm, I'm not... I'm, <laughs>
They should sponsor We're us. We're the poor us. man's Peloton. Peloton. Stuff. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Would we bring okay. ourselves out to that level? Can we, Sorry. Can we, just, we can fix that in post, right? Yeah. What else have you got for us? <laughs> uh, next up, I have this guy here on the desk. Uh, this is the Lexan City Energy Charger speaker. I really like this. This has been living on my desk for the last few months. Um, again, it's from 3.ie. The idea is that you plug in your cable on the back. Uh, it's USB-C. And then you just stand your phone on it and it works as a charger so again you're not having to have extra cables on your desk it has a speaker and a mic on it as well so you can take your calls uh, through it and you can listen to your music it's very affordable it's 60 euro and i think if you are someone who like me is a bit of a neat freak and doesn't like cables and junk and clutter this serves multiple purposes and it's only 60 quid so i like it a lot i was gonna say so it it, it sounds like one of those um kids cartoons where they're like what do children like they like cars and dinosaurs and transformers let's put them all together and make them out there so it, what is it exactly so it is a charger a speaker and there's a mic built into it as well so okay. it's a kind of an all-in-one desk thing is the technical term do those charges just work yeah. Right, you just put the phone on and it just works. Well, you have, phones. you have to make sure that you're positioning it correctly. So if you have it kind of like sitting off the side or anything like that, it has to be, it, on iPhones anyway, it, it essentially has to cover the Apple logo. That's where the charger part is. Ah, okay. Then on, it's the same with the MagSafe, the Apple MagSafe, that's their official chargers. Okay. So you, again, you have to make sure that it's stuck on and it's it, within the certain zone because I have sometimes laid my phone down on a charger and thinking it's charging, but it's not actually charging, so you just need to double check that. Yeah, it's a bit finicky. It's um, a bit finicky. But getting rid of cables is good in, in all our lives because there's too many of them. Yes. Uh, okay, what else? Well, this is another chargery gadget, and this I got asked about this on the Pat Kenny show the other week, and I, it kind of reminds me of how good it is. So back in the day when I used to travel, this was the first thing that went into my backpack. It's by a company called Juku, and it is a, a power bank. So it's a 10,000 milliamp battery, so it will charge your phone between two and a half and four times, depending on the battery capacity of your device. Uh, but it also has a little wi wireless charging patch on the front, so again, you can just lay your phone down on top of it if you forget to bring a cable with you when you're out and about, or it has multiple ports. So it has two USB ports, a USB-C port and a micro USB port as well. So it can charge pretty much everything and it's 70 euro. So that is, it's a staple for me when I used to travel and have fun in my life. Would you be interested in swapping that for a rookie? No. Okay. Thanks so. though. That's a bit of a shame. <laughs> Try. That looks class. That would be a, pr a pr that would be an excellent. <laughs> okay, I'm going to give it to you because this is so tragic. Happy oh Christmas. God, oh my god. Oh my god. You're Do you want so the rookie back? No. You're, Look at oh me. Oh my god. You are so <laughs> shameless. This is actually like, embarrassing. You, this is. This is I'm going to HR about this. <laughs> I mean. I'm going to HR about you and everybody else. Really, the the bullying campaign that's underway here. This is an excellent uh, invention. Thank you so much for this. I. Why honestly, do you need you can that? Have it back. You can honestly have why, it back. Why do you need that? I mean, this is like I mean, festivals are cancelled at the moment, but this would be so good for a festival. That's exactly perfect. what it's for. So you charge it up. Say if you're going to EP, you charge it up before you yes. leave the house, and you do not need to worry about your phone again until the Monday when you're back home. And I'm not sure if you heard, but I'm an iPhone guy now, and uh, the battery in uh, Apple devices not as good as Android. I think it's fair to say. Ooh, so very, shots yeah. fired. That's true. What phone? What iPhone do you have? Uh, 12? Uh, yeah, no, the 13. There's a big leap in the 13. There you go. Do you have an iPhone 13 to review this morning that you might give to Happy somebody Christmas, studio? Owen. <laughs> you can go and whistle now for the rest of this, I'm afraid. Wow. Wow, this is like the most profitable moments of your life. <laughs> it really is. Now, you're going to have to do some exercise, Owen, so uh, with every with every yin, there's a yang. Well, I mean, that is uh, that's a small price I'm willing to pay for. So can I, can I talk to you both just briefly? You mentioned about, like, life used to be good. What is life like? Are you, are you both kind of, like, uh, surfing the slumps at the moment? Life was good for a month or two. I want to say. I'm not sure what your experience was. I kind of didn't embrace it, like, the uh, restrictions being lifted. I was still kind of waiting for everything to calm after the initial lift. So mm. I feel like it's been two years. Like I can't really believe it's Christmas because I've constantly been waiting since March 2020 to be able to live my life a little bit, which is kind of grim and a little bit sad. And I can't wait to travel again. I can't wait to go to gigs again. I can't wait to go to festivals again. But I just, I don't know, it's a bit grim. Have you travelled at all? I was in Lisbon yeah. uh, for two days, or for, yeah, 24 hours essentially. And then I was at my sister's wedding in the UK for three days. And how did you find that experience? Totally fine. Travelling was great. I love, like, you know, I love being in an airport. So I went plenty early, faffed around, had a great time, felt completely safe the entire time. But I, I don't know how much of it is, like, anxiety about anxiety versus 
real life issues. Now, obviously, the numbers aren't great at the moment, so we won't be doing anything. But if you think about how much I used to travel, I was away a few times a month, every month of 2019. Yeah, I think you both would have been, right? Like, yeah. uh, that's the, the joy of uh, being at your stage of life. Like, you've got to get it back. You just have to go and do it and, and mm. accept that this is, your reality is going to be, it's going to be masking, it's going to take ages. You're going to need booster shots every six months, but like, get busy living and get busy dying. I'm I'm absolutely uh, subscribed to that theory. I think you know the way everybody's asking for like an extra bank holiday or something. I think that the, the real move needs to be the government needs to give all of us the opportunity to just subtract two years off our age and go back to the age that we were so in I'm March 2020. Again. That's all, I'm all about. That. Big birthday this year for you. Thanks Big so for you. Much. This what is age you be? Uh, 25, I think. 42 so is the best age. I'm telling you. 42 is the best age. I, yeah, and I did uh, life starts when I was when I when I hit that the first time around. I was like, I'm just going to stay here now. That's it. Um, when people ask me forever, I'm just going to go until I can no longer get away with it, which it turned out was about six months. <laughs> Does life start at 40? Is that true? No, no. <laughs> you're in the you're in the sweet spot now. Okay. This is it. You better enjoy this I'm right now. My life. Because it'll no disappear pressure, really so. quickly. How am I doing with my life? Okay, so uh, back to the gifts. Yeah. Great. Something Owen can't have. Uh, no, <laughs> Owen can't have this, even though it is the ultimate Owen gadget. Because I don't know if you were watching last week's tech uh, gift guide, but. Owen is an Apple guy. Uh, he's just all about yeah, that Apple life. Yeah, made a transition, life. guys. Not sure if you if you're aware. He's an Apple guy until another brand comes along and gives him free stuff. But um, to complete his Apple guy ness, this is what he would need, but he's not getting. It's the Apple HomePod Mini. It's 99 euro, and it's Apple's smart speaker. So if you know Siri from the phones, you'll be all too familiar with this. But as you'll see, it's very neat, and it's got that speakery mesh all around it. So you get the 360 effect when you're listening to music or podcasts. Everything sounds amazing. Through it. The voice recognition I find is a little bit hit and miss. There's times when she doesn't hear me and then there's other times when she does. Uh, but in general, I think it is excellent. And what I would say is if you are someone who doesn't have that many Apple gadgets in your home, you may be better off going with the Google Home that we spoke about last week. But if, like Owen, you live and die by that Apple logo, uh, this would be a great addition to your home. I will trade you a Google Nest for it. One that you got free from... Yes. <laughs> like two years ago. Two years ago. <laughs> do you not use it? Is it not I good? Do, no, I use it all the time, but I'm, a, I'm an Apple guy. Okay, now. right. You've changed. Yeah. Um, I feel like we were playing poker. We're just like looking across. I'll, like absolutely. Go. I've got a couple of things that I'm willing, that I'm willing to barter here for sure. Um, but that's my stuff. Exactly. I was going to say, <laughs> Jess, you've, you've put everything into the middle here and, and he's flipped and still won. <laughs> I'm just a nice person. He's an Apple guy. I'm a nice guy. That's how it works. Uh, the... the um, the difference between Google and Alexa mm. and Siri, uh, like they're all effectively the same? Uh, they are and they aren't. Like I find Google works better on its own. As a standalone product, I think Google works better. I think Alexa has quite a few ring fences around it to make sure that you're using other Amazon products. The good thing about the Google stuff is that the Google stuff is very much what we use on a day-to-day -day basis. So whether that is YouTube, um, the Google Chromecast in the TV, a lot of the Philips Hue smart bulbs, I find that they all kind of talk to each other a little bit better. Now, the Alexa devices are getting there in terms of the, the crossover with other brands. But for me, I am still a, a Google Home person. I kind of only use Alexa to listen to digital audio, so our podcasts or the radio stations uh, or Spotify. Mm. I Yeah, I kind of use it in a different way in that I do that, but I also get it to turn on my TV. I get it to control my lights. I get it to set timers. I get it to write my shopping list, to issue like reminders to me. Um, the first thing I do actually always is ask if it's going to rain today so I know whether or not to bring a coat. I know that's incredibly basic. And no, I, I do that too, sorry, and, and Alexa works for that. I, like, yeah. What's the temperature going to be tomorrow? How, how many layers do I need if I'm cycling in? Which obviously hasn't happened in a while, but... <laughs> I find them useful, I like them. Okay, okay. And is there anything else on the phone? Like, now that Owen is an Apple guy mm. and a recent convert, mm -hmm. uh, are we missing stuff? Like, what... what you know, it, it was only last week that I realised that the camera can do all sorts of other things. I accidentally slid the slider along the way and was like, oh, yeah. oh wow, look at this. Do you not know that? No. Uh, no, I was like, this camera's not great. And then I was like, oh, I'm using the wrong functions. No, so what what they're doing, so I have the iPhone 13. What one do you have? I think it's the same. Yeah. So this one, I find, it definitely is the best one in quite a few years. The big jumps were in the battery and the camera and the camera... <laughs> 
Well, uh, I think you uh, realise that I have a Juku now that will help me out with my battery It sits right in your pocket there, Owen. <laughs> they are actually very compact, to be fair. But anyway, um, the, the camera is amazing. The annoying thing, the thing that I really struggle with at all of the phone launches I go to is that they spend so long talking about the different settings within the camera that you can enable to make it work. I just want it to work. Yeah. Now, the Google Pixel 6, although I love the iPhone 13, the Google Pixel 6, in my opinion, is one of the best phones of the year because you can just take a picture and the AI on the camera does all the heavy lifting for you. So you don't need to worry about focus, blur, any of that kind of stuff. There's also a cool feature called Magic Eraser. So if I take a picture, and so say if I took a picture of the two of you now, but we didn't want Owen in the picture, I could just circle Owen with a magic eraser and he would disappear as if by Excellent. magic. And I've the been AI. I've trying to do that for years, Owen. <laughs> keeps, the, he keeps showing up for work. I'm like, come on, what are you doing? The AI then would like patch the background so you don't get that weird sort of ghost like blur. <laughs> it would just fill it in. I think it's. Wow, amazing. that's great for all those broken relationships, isn't it? <laughs> it's really handy for that. Yeah, like. Yeah. Ghost them in real life and now your technology can catch up with you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, it, it's me at Niagara Falls on my own. <laughs> A big weirdo. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this took a dark turn. Yep. Uh, are there, uh, last one, so people are going to get new phones, right? Uh -huh. Are there easy, like, is there a whole, I mean, I haven't looked, I probably should have, but I presume there are people on YouTube who will give you not like four hour long lessons about how to use your iPhone? Because I, I still am using it the same way I would have used <coughs> all the other phones <clears throat> and thinking like, what, what's the big deal? There doesn't seem to be a big deal. and I, I don't feel like I'm missing stuff. Yeah, like th there are tutorials on YouTube for that, but I think like on iPhones in particular, there's a little yellow icon with the light bulb and it's called tips. And if you just go into there, it will highlight different features. So whether that is within iOS 15, whether that is with other add-on devices like AirPods or Apple Watches, um, you can find ways to do it, but I do think a lot of it is just trial and error and playing around with it. Um, because some of those videos, although I do have a series as well called Tech Bytes, you can watch on the News Talk YouTube channel, um, some of them get super nerdy, and I just think life is too short to be, you know, messing around with that sort of stuff. Um, but the tips little thing on the iPhone is very helpful. All right, Jess, good stuff. That's brilliant. Thank you very much for that. News Talk Tech Correspondent Jess Kelly, the uh, gift guide. We'll put it up on the uh, OTB sports app and I guess we cut the video as well I guess so uh, like I mean if you could like erase use the eraser to erase the part where I absolutely scrounged a couple of gifts yeah. that would be great <laughs> so I can do it again next time <laughs> happy Christmas yes thanks very much for that a reminder OTB AM is brought to you by Gillette good morning start with Gillette put your best face forward with their new and improved razors here's what's coming up on OTB Sports Radio today at half past ten it's live the club championship show OTB Gold is an Irish football special with Shea Given, Niall Quinn, Jason McAteer and Kevin Kilban. The Koi Gig Pod from three today is a Vera Powell interview. Our retro panel is Ireland versus England, 1995. Um, that's pretty good. And OTB Gold is Colm Gooch Cooper at six and the show will be live tonight from seven. Now, up next this morning, Fintan Drury is going to join us live to chat about his new book, Seesaw. OTB AM on OTB Sports Radio, Ireland's first and only sports radio station. Have you subscribed to the OTB Football Podcast? If not, here's some of what you've missed over the last week. I always tell the story, you know, I remember seeing Ruth for Nisseroy doing shooting sessions and it was either rocketed in the bottom corner or top corner. I was 100 yards over the bar. He didn't care. And Benteke said something that really struck me about Klopp and he said, is your friend... He said, but he's not your best friend. I think he's very, very clever at diffusing guys who are not happy. Subscribe now to the OTB Football Podcast stream wherever you get your podcasts and download the OTB Sports app. Car insurance is boring, but you don't have to be. Get Set Go is the kind of car insurance you can sort in a few minutes online. Then bounce on with your day. Are you ready for quick start insurance? Get a quote now at getsetgo.ie. MCL Insurance Services Ireland Limited Trading is gets at go.ie is regulated by the Central Bank of Ireland. OTB AM With Gillette. Put your best face forward with our new and improved razors. Three minutes past nine this morning and I'm delighted to welcome Fintan Drury to the show who's just written a book called Seesaw about leadership and his career in many different aspects of Irish life. It's particularly the sports aspect that we're focusing on this morning, Fintan. But good morning to you. How are you getting on? I'm good. How are you, Jar? Yeah, pretty good. Pretty good. How's the book going for you? Yeah, it's going. It's going all, all right. I was just talking to Tommy before uh, you uh, introduced me there and saying that you know it's it's a kind of niche book, Jar. It's not going to be of 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 wide interest. Um, 
And it's also, you know, when you hear people on, on a show like this who haven't uh, <coughs> watched or heard of Sex in the City, um, <laughs> then you realize that uh, it's going to appeal to a certain um, cohort, but uh, not necessarily uh, the younger generations. I have heard of Roy Keane, though. <laughs> Who's he? <laughs> <laughs> Makes a bit of a difference. We're kind of talking the 1990 and 94 World Cups here, though, on. Yeah, well, Roy Keane was at the 94 World Cup, sure. It's true, it's true, in fairness. So the, let's start with that, because the, the players' pool, I think, is this... Um, a certain people of a certain generation will be familiar with the term and how the term became something that the public was aware of. Like one of those uh, phrases that, you know, um, during the boom we learned new words and, and during the bus we learned new words, but the players' pool was something that kind of became part of the public's consciousness. What was the players' pool and how did it come into being? Well, the players' pool, first of all, was a concept that knocked around British football for for quite some time. I mean, I'm a Manchester City fan, so I'm pretty in pretty good form this morning. But um, when they won the FA Cup, I remember as a youngster uh, becoming aware that the players had a pool for commercial work that was done in, for, ahead of an FA Cup final. Um, but then many years later, uh, when I found myself uh, becoming involved in sports management for the first time, I was approached by Kevin Moore and Liam Brady uh, to advise the Irish team on the commercial side of qualifying for the World Cup in 1990. And we set up a player's pool, which was focused exclusively on generating as much income as possible for all of the players as a collective, a full squad. And we also included some of the back back room uh, members of the coaching staff, and physios and the, the bag man, Charlie O'Leary, I remember was involved. And the idea was that the players formed this collective. We created a brand called the Players Pool. It was actually a logo developed. And we took that to the, to the commercial market um, with a view to generating additional income for the players and they, they were a phenomenal squad of players. They were all playing, at, most of them playing at the top level in, in England. But it does show you that back then in 1990, even though they were very well paid for players of their time, of their generation, um, they still needed to generate additional income. So we created this, this uh, vehicle, if you like, uh, to... Um, ensure that there was a commercial spin-off for the players as opposed to the association from uh, their qualification for the World Cup in 1990. They had qualified for the World Cup, uh, a big part for the European Championship in 1988. They qualified for the World Cup in 1990 and again in 1994. Um, I, I think you've done yourself and, and the book a disservice in, in terms of saying that it's going to be of niche interest. It's actually really fascinating to... Um, to listen to the story of that and I'll get into that in more details but it, it should be of interest to anybody who's interested in rugby or also GA because you've kind of been involved in, in massive big moments kind of hinge moments in, in those sports as well so to go back to um, to go back to the, the players pool there's a, a, a brilliant comparison between Arnold O'Byrne of Opal and Charlie Hawhey uh, doing his lap of honour at the World Cup, which uh, when you when you wrote it down, I was like, yeah, that, that actually, that rings true because my recollection of being um, 10, 12, 14, watching the Republic of Ireland qualify for tournaments was that Arnold O'Byrne and Opal had played a central role in this. They were there with the green jersey and the Irish Wolfhound in his jersey going, we got the team, we drove the team to Germany, essentially. It was like, uh, you know, it, advertising really worked for Opal and Arnold O'Byrne in particular became a minor celebrity a la Morris Pratt at the time but uh, the players weren't getting any of that cash. No, the, the, it was all uh, driven by the association, excuse the pun, um, and uh, very, you know, very successfully. But that's just the way things were, were done at that time. Uh, and the opportunity was because the players were so well known as club players, and then they were carrying Ireland uh, to the World Cup for the first time in 1990, uh, there was clearly an opportunity to use the personalities uh, to if, give effect to something very different. And, you know, it, 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 it created a, a bit of a storm at the time because the way in which we launched it was we, we undertook a, a photograph, uh, by, did this by stealth at the end of a, of a training session, um, 
one one day the the and, and a certain people made sure that Jack Charlton uh, had been had been moved away from the, the training pitches, and we very quickly assembled the squad in a standard squad pho uh, photograph, and we got a a, a pretty well known uh, sports photographer to take the photograph of the squad wearing T-shirts bearing the Irish permanence logo. And uh, they were just plain green T-shirts, so they weren't wearing the official Irish squad, uh, Irish, Irish um, shirt. And we we kept that under wraps until the team qualified, and then we launched launched it with 48 sheet posters um, once qualification had been secured. And the impact was was dramatic, and the Irish permanent. Uh, became as well associated with the Irish squad, even though the, uh, as as Opel did, over those four years between 1990 and 1994, and um, it was dramatic because it it broke the notion that the only people who could sponsor uh, the the Irish football team, the only way they could people could do that, or commercial enterprises could do that, was through the association. We broke that. Uh, assumed position, and it, it, it went to it, it went to the steps of the, of the High Court. Um, Opel uh, took a legal case uh, against us, and the players supported us. Um, the FAI remained kind of neutral on it because it wasn't actually legally their problem, um, and we won the day. And, and obviously the, the players needed the money and that was the, the driving force behind them. So they, they rallied him to make sure that you had the, the support when Opel came to the steps of the high court. I, I, Jerry, I think it was more than that. It wasn't just that they, they needed the money or well, some of them needed the money more than others. Um, but what they absolutely believed was that this was a matter of principle and that it was important to uh, you know set, set new boundaries for the future. And that served... Um, Irish footballers very well um, ever since. It, it helps to modernise the, the FAI's relationship with the players as well because now obviously the players get contracted to do a certain number of appearances for the sponsors and they get compensation for that as opposed to back in the day where they were expected to show up we'll give you we'll give you a bit of gear and uh, maybe there'll be a, an envelope with a, a few pounds in it but there might not be. Yeah, it, 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 look, it was a point in time it was a line in the sand and, and in, in fairness to Arnold O'Byrne, um, that's how many people who were chief executives of large corporations that were sponsoring sports bodies or, or, or athletes behaved at that time. Uh, that's become much less pronounced now. Um, I, there's, there's large sections in the book that deal with the relationship that Brian Kerr had with John Delaney and John Delaney's stewardship of the FAI. I'm conscious that there is an ongoing investigation from the ODCE, so I don't want to uh, step on any of that. And I would urge everybody to go and read the book. But can we talk about Brian Kerr in particular, who uh, was a client of yours and his time at the FAI? It, it, it almost felt like um, when the changing of the guard happened at the FAI, that Kerr's time was doomed almost irrespective of what happened, even though he himself didn't end up giving his best performance or, or, or fully actualizing his talents when he was the Ireland manager. Is that fair? Um, look, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not evading uh, the, the, the question, I'm, but I'm not competent to really evaluate his performance as Ireland manager in terms of you know, how the team played and the results, etc. And you can argue these things uh, from both perspectives or from either... You, in, in terms of the relationship between Brian and the FAI, I think, as I said on the Pat Kenny show the other morning, the fundamental problem um, with what happened was that Brian was exited Irish football at a time when he had contributed massively with the technical development of, of the sport. Uh, he was the technical director as he became uh, manager of the senior team. Um, and when he finished as manager of the senior team, he didn't just fin finish as manager of the senior team. He was allowed to leave. And he was a prized um, asset of the association and he should have been retained and he could have been retained. But they exacerbated that problem 
because he was succeeded as technical director by Packy Bonner, who brought a very significant amount of knowledge um, to the association. And within a number of years, he was exited. And he continues to this day working um, in a technical uh, capacity uh, with UEFA. And over all of those years, uh, the intellectual capital of those two men, the football intellectual capital of those two men was lost to the association. That, that, that was a, a grievous error um, and has, in my opinion, done immense damage to the development of the sport here. I see some parallels. They're both, they're, they're both friends of mine. So, you know, spoiler alert, to use your term from earlier in the program, you know, I, people need to, people who wouldn't know that need to understand. I'm, I'm not giving, this is a, not a, uh, an objective view, but it's, it's a view based, it's a view that I think a lot of people would share. Well, in that context, right? Because um, it, reading the book now in, in parallel with what's going on with Stephen Kenny, um, it feels like Irish football is trapped in this uh, constant cycle where we find people who are good, we put them in the position where they should be in, and there's always somebody somewhere spinning against them from within. It, it's like normal roles, normal jobs, you have to manage the stakeholders, but you frequently don't expect to be in trouble with your own people. That, that's the worst part. It's like... I, and I don't know, is it, is it a disease that's specific to Irish football or is it a disease that's specific to Irish life? I, look, I think the same, same problem manifests itself in, in football in, in England um, in lots of different ways. There's lots of different examples. I, I would have hope uh, for the future of, of the FAI. I think Jonathan Hill, whom I don't know, everybody speaks very highly of. I know people who work with him in the UK and speak highly of him. Um, I know Roy Barrett uh, personally uh, for many years, and he's a good person with a, a, a good outlook for um, the future of the sport. And, and look, the, the fact that Packy Bonner has been brought back in, albeit just as, a, as a non-executive director of the board is is a positive and there there are there are better structures in place uh, probably more work needs to be done on that but i would be hopeful that that phenomenon which you correctly i, I identify uh is is going to be less of a problem going forward uh, notwithstanding the fact that your friends are brian it, it's very um honest of you then to include in the book a, a, an incident that happens on the last word where um he he's under pressure and is it with Matt Cooper or was it with, with Eamon at that stage? Had Matt already? No, it was Matt. It was Matt, okay. And um, maybe you'd be better to tell us exactly what happened. What did happen? Well, it was at that point of, you know, he was just under siege, uh, Brian, um, in terms of the, the, the FAI was spinning against him. Um, I don't think the football journalists or most of the football journalists at that time covered themselves in glory. Some of them have since acknowledged that. They, they were kind of taking the FAI line. The results were patchy at best. And um, it was all a bit of a struggle and it was getting very kind of um, intense within our core group. So that was the late, great Noel O'Reilly, myself, Brian, Chris Hewton, who was Brian's uh, uh, coach, and um, Jerry Smith. And, and, and we were kind of meeting and talking through what was going on. We could see what was happening. Brian felt under phenomenal pressure. And I made a really poor decision for somebody who had a lot of experience in communications management, who was previously a broadcaster himself. Um, and I went on to the last word um, with Matt Cooper who's knowledgeable on, on football and uh, did an interview like the interview we're doing now. And in the, in the midst of it, in, in trying to defend Brian, I said, I used a phrase like, uh, you know, it's, but they're not, they're not even the greatest squad of players we've ever had, which was factually correct, but wasn't the wisest term to use, particularly when your client is exposed because the FAI picked that line up and within an hour, they were spinning like mad uh, against me. And we were in a kind of guerrilla war at the time. So I gave them that opportunity to say, look, here's the uh, agent for the, the manager of the team saying publicly that it's a 
crap group of players. That's not what I said, but that's what the, the spin was. Um, the comparison I was making, of course, was between the squads of 1990 and 1994. Um, but but it was my it was it was a it was a really really sloppy error. And I make the point in the book because it has a sort of wider context in terms of the the overall uh, view I'm trying to give of of leadership within with and success with within uh, within the book. I make I just make the point that you know sometimes when you're too close to the action and when you feel every hurt that your client is is feeling because you're very close to that person you can make poor judgments and I lacked the objectivity at that at that point in time to give Brian the quality advice that he should have got I guess if that comment was made today, Finton, it maybe wouldn't have had such a difference for a number of different reasons. Like, why do you think commenting on the playing group not being the best playing group of all time had such an impact? Because I think managers, coaches of Irish teams have said that exact thing in the aftermath, let alone uh, somebody working outside the camp with, with the Ireland manager. Well, I mean, I, I was speaking with uh, Dion Fanning about this uh, relatively recently, and he was a football car. He was one of the football correspondents. Correspondents at the time, he would say that he would acknowledge that he didn't uh, give us the kind of objectivity and treatment or the and that deep analysis, if you like, of what the FAI was doing. So I think Owen, that really what was uh, what was happening was it wasn't what I said. It was just that it provided an opportunity to the association, which wanted to continue to undermine the, per, the, the position of, the, of its manager. I mean, bizarre behavior, but that's what was happening. I provided them with another line, another opportunity to go after the manager, through me, if you like. There's an amazing story where you talk about Brian uh, showing up for, I don't know, is it a sport against racism or is it a gold mile photo shoot where he, he wears the St. Patrick Athletic jersey and they have a telecom sponsor, but Aircom are actually the sponsor of the Republic of Ireland. And this is another stick that the, IR, that the FAI tried to beat him with. Uh, unbeknownst to them, you were actually in contact with Aircom and saying, is this an issue? And they're saying it's not an issue. So I, I think it's those type of details that will help to uh, build a picture for anybody who wants to understand exactly what the FAI was like around that period of time. And it's, it's, a, good, um, it's a good campaign piece to um, champagne football. Uh, if if anybody I mean, everybody read that book last year so I think anybody who is interested in, in uh, learning a bit more about that should should dig out to see so can we talk about some of the other sporting organisations as well the the Johnny Sexton transfer um, Johnny Sexton was a client of yours at, at that time so you you know exactly how that deal came to be made and again the great detail on it in the book um, in retrospect what's your view of that whole period of time are, are you talking about in, in the first instance, his move to France or move back from France? Both, both really now. Like at the remove, when you're sitting down writing the book, what are your emotions as you're going through that whole thing? Well, Johnny's a man I respect a great deal. We're friends. Um, and uh, I was felt excited to, to represent him um, when I did. Uh, and he, you know, felt, I, I'm, I'm oversimplifying this, but he felt a little bit unloved by uh, the IRFU um, at, at the time of the move to Racing Metro. And that was part of what made it happen. But, but ultimately the reason he went to, to Racing was because the, 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 the financial terms were, were phenomenal. Um, and it, he became one of the highest paid players in the world. Um, but also he was really excited by the opportunity to uh, work with coaches in, in, in a new club, in a different club, um, and play in his rugby, his club rugby in, in France. And I, I think one of the points that um, I try to make in the book about, about representing players, particularly professional footballers, but, but also rugby union uh, players, is that a, a good agent, uh, which I like to think I, I am, a good agent doesn't think about the money until other work has been done in advance. And that starts and started in that case with Johnny, with my going to Paris and, and meeting with the coaches and reviewing the, the setup and looking at where he would might live and going through all of that kind of thorough assessment 
of the setup for him, what it would be like to live there and for him and, and, and Laura. So, you know, I spent a weekend over there um, meeting, meeting people, all the senior people in the club. And I came back and had, you know, prepared a written assessment. We sat down uh, and went through it and discussed it a number of times before he then went over with me uh, sort of maybe a fortnight or so later. And he was very, he, you know, he spent a lot of time with the coaches and um, essentially we came, we came back and, and, and made, a, made a decision that uh, if the IRFU didn't move the needle sufficiently, um, that he would go. Um, and when I say we, I should correct myself. I don't ever, I have never ever told a player in any code, uh, uh, you know, where to go, what to make decision to make. They've always made the decisions themselves as to what club to go to or to stay in a particular club. But in this particular case, you know, we, we, we went through it very, very thoroughly. And the view was that if the IRFU moved the needle significantly, but not up to the level that uh, Racing was prepared to pay, that Johnny would stay. And it just didn't happen. Um, and off he went and, um, you know, it was, it was pretty controversial at the time. Uh, I shipped a bit of criticism, but that's fine. Uh, you're just doing your job. Everything was done properly. Um, and two years later, um, he came back and that's when, uh, our uh, professional relationship ended. Um, and one of the things I think I write about in the book is, is how he did that. Um, and effectively how he fired me. Um, and we were, we were really close. Um, and, um, but, but it was, I think you guys who, you know, who cover sport all the time will, will, will understand this and that, that he, he fired me the way he is on the pitch. You know, it was, he, he called me, he discussed it with me, but he, he was just, very clear, very frank as to why. And uh, I understood why. And, uh, and that was it. Um, there was there was no hesitation. It was like he is when he picks a ball up and there's some somebody or maybe a platter of players between him and the line and he's going to get there. <laughs> it's brutal. Um, it, it is brutal. Uh, you had kind of seen in first at first hand. So he rings Philip Brown himself to say, I'm going. Like he makes that call. He doesn't get you, even though that your job is to, to do all that stuff in, in the first place. So you're on the receiving end of that call the next time around. Yeah, no, and actually that's a good point here that I, I should have made because it does it does illustrate just the the, the, the metal of the man. Um and uh exactly that. When he when he made the decision that he was gonna go to Paris, you know, he wanted to make the call himself. So he takes responsibility for his own actions in and and um, and he was, you know, he was equally direct with me, and um, and that was just the way it was. And I was hurt and upset um, uh, on a number of different levels because we were we were you know we were good friends. I'm I'm glad to say we we are again today and have been for for quite some time. Why did he fire you? It was clear that it would be uh, easier to get the deal done and the way in which the deal um, was going to be structured um, if I wasn't going to be involved. Um, it wasn't that he had any less um, trust in my ability or that he had any doubts over my capacity to get the job done. Um, I was still at that time in, in discussions with Racing because we were looking at and, and one other club in France because we were we were looking at the at the different options as his as his contract with Racing was coming to an end. So um there were extraneous reasons as to why it, he 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 understood that it would be easier to get the deal done without my being involved. And and he accepted that as he was perfectly entitled to do and and uh, and he fired me. And look, it's also very important, you know, I, I, I often say to young players, I'm a phenomenally talented young player who I'm delighted to represent for the last 
four or five years called Ethan Ampadu, uh, Chelsea player, Welsh boy. And, you know, he's been at a number of clubs on loan, as football fans will, will know and understand. And you're constantly educating or helping young players to to, under, to to see that, you know, they're, a manager will, managers come and go, and even managers who have faith in them for a period of time may lose faith in them and may leave, leave them out of the team or squad for, for a period of time. So you've got to help your, your players understand that, right? But you've got to understand it about yourself as well. You know, that, that you could be fired, that you could be left out, that somebody can lose, you know, interest in being represented by you. So you have to accept that when it happens. One final thing I wanted to, to talk about in the time we have left was the the praise for Porrick Duffy is as high praise as I've seen um, compared to anybody else in, in the book almost uh, as, as the quality of an administrator and somebody who was good to deal with over a period of time. Because you, you were an advisor to the GPA when they were doing the deal, the first deal that brought them inside the tent of the relationship they have now with the GA. What was it about Porrick Duffy that was so singular in, in terms of how he stood out for you? Two quick things, Ger. First of all, that was, to me, it's one of the proudest things I was involved in um, in 30 years working in, in, in professional sport. To, to work with Donal Logan and uh, Desi Farrell on, on, on getting that deal done was a really proud moment. Look, Porrick Duffy, the, the best and most succinct way I can put this is when the FAI got itself into dire trouble years ago, and the, uh, I, I was trying to use some influence in certain quarters, and I said, get Porrick Duffy had, it's not that long ago, because Porrick had only just retired as, as head of the GAA, and I said, get that man in there and get him in fast, get him into Abbottstown and get him to sort it out. That's, that, like... And football is my sport. I love most sports, but football is my sport. And it upsets me what happened with, within the FAI. There was the the man to sort it out. He he was quite. He, he is an exceptional, uh, ex- exceptionally talented administrator. And the GAA uh, has benefited enormously from his time with his hand on the tiller. Look, what, what, what sets him apart? Because that, that's really interesting. I haven't heard anybody say that before, Fintan. What, what sets him apart from other administrators? Very, first of all, very capable, just uh, uh, bright man, very understated, very, very calm and direct and honest. You know, those are like, they, they, they may not seem like uh, massively uh, um, it, that, that might not seem like a, 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 a very strong endorsement, Owen, because they're mm. such basic characteristics. But in fact, in, in, in my experience in professional sport, it's those basic characteristics that are the real riches that are often missing. Um, and, and I found him to be um, exceptionally good to deal with. Uh, you, you're a football agent mainly now, or do you still represent people for, in, in other sports? Have you kind of just focused exclusively on football at this stage? Yeah, just football, yeah. And that that's just the, the right thing to do. The, the rugby ended up being more of a pain. Well, ultimately, you're in you're in business um, to to make a return, and if the 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 scale uh, of professional football is such that uh, the numbers we know this the numbers are just um, very much greater than than what you're dealing with uh, for doing the same job in rugby union. That makes sense, uh, Fintan. I wish you the very best of luck with the book. I, I genuinely uh, say people can read it in a couple of hours, and we haven't even touched on Anglo or Paddy Power or Brian Cowan, which are also huge pillars in the book so um, it's a remarkable achievement to get it all down and tie the strands together of a career that it's a bit like Forrest Gump like front row seats for some massive massive moments in history Forrest Gump I mean that in the nicest possible way by the way thanks thanks to that Ger Um, you might have to explain to all your listeners who uh, never heard of Sex (laughs) and the City who Forrest Gump is by the way 
Best of luck with the book, Fenton. Thanks a million for joining Cheers, us. Cheers. Thanks very much, Owen. Thank you, Jerry. It's, uh, it's called Seesaw and it's available wherever you can get the books. But like, honestly, you'll read the sports section in a couple of hours and go, oh, right, wow, that was, uh, that was, that was a big moment. That's another big moment. Mm. That's another big moment. And it's the, it's the three main sports and you, could, you get to very clearly compare and contrast how well or otherwise the sports are administered and you get to... As the man says, pays your money and make your own choice up. 9.34 this morning, OTBAM brought to you by Gillette. Good morning, start with Gillette. Put your best face forward with their new and improved razors. We haven't talked NBA at all since the season started. No. Apart from LeBron uh, getting ejected and having the row. Yes. Very briefly. But what's been happening is that Steph Curry has been tearing it up. The Warriors are back. Steve Kerr is going to take the USA job, is he, for the next Olympics? Has yeah, that been confirmed? So. I'm yeah. not sure it's been confirmed, but that's... He's, they're just reaching a point now where they're ascending to the level of Jordan's Bulls. They're getting there. If they win another title, and, and like, as it comes to be written in future, we're going to look back on this as a glorious period of time where something remarkable was happening that we should be watching more of. What happened overnight? Uh, yeah, well, f- first of all, like I mean, it's interesting when you, when you talk about that that Warriors are the best team in the NBA at the moment on their current record. He can go and get his fourth ring of his career this year. Steph Curry, uh, LeBron has four rings to put it into context. I think the comparisons with the Bulls maybe is when they had the seventy three win season. That was really or the single season comparison. Are there? He's going to have to have a brilliant twilight of, of his career to to be considered in the, in the same breath as Jordan. I suspect by most people. But last night he officially became the greatest shooter in the history of the NBA. He uh, surpassed Ray Allen in terms of three-pointers made. Ray Allen was in the building last night. It was in Madison Square Garden, by the way. He's been chasing this for a couple of games. His last game was away to the Pacers no, in just... Indiana. He somehow missed a late shot and he was like, mm, not sure about this. But with a second three of the game, first three of the game last night, ties the record, uh, second three of the game, breaks the record. Ray Allen was in the building to congratulate him. Reggie Miller, Miller was on commentary working as an analyst there last night. Miller also happened to be in the building 10 years ago when Ray Allen broke the previous record, which was Reggie Miller's record himself. So Miller seems to be a, a constant. Uh, like, I mean, we've done this on the show many a time, but like Steph Curry has been to the front of a generation of players who has totally changed the game. You see the, the new kids that are coming through who are also phenomenal shooters. They have robbed his technique, the off the dribble uh, shot which you can do nothing about unless you've got cat-like reflexes to stop him. Um, as I say, they're having a, a brilliant season. They're 23 and 5. And even if you take away his shooting, he's such a, a brilliant guard. Like, probably down to Steve Kerr a lot of this, but he screens as much as any point guard does. His ability to pick a pass is obviously exceptional. What's interesting is in, in the aftermath of, of uh, last night is that there was some talk about who actually got the pass to Steph for his record-breaking shot because Draymond Green wanted it and it ended up being Andrew Wiggins who got the, the killer pass for Steph and Draymond said afterwards that Wiggins never passes on that play and Curry said it's the first time I think he got that pass off Andrew Wiggins so everybody wanted to be on, on the act. Uh, Steph Curry's 33. We'll come back and we'll do a proper piece on this and, and uh, talk about the historical context of it all because I think there's a chance that uh, history will be written to the point where he changed the game and that elevates him. I'm not saying he was as good a basketballer as Jordan, of course, but I think he suddenly in a couple of years time if they add another couple of rings that the conversations change and, and what people talk about changes as well I've got to tell you about it, a feast of live sports on Friday if the game goes ahead Montpellier versus Leinster in the European Champions Cup live from GGL Stadium on Sunday it's Leicester versus Connacht in the European Champions Cup live from Welford Road Conor Morris and Gavin Duffy on duty for that one Spurs versus Liverpool live from the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium Nathan and Brian Kerr on duty for that a reminder OTBA and brought to you by Gillette good morning start with Gillette put your best face forward with their new and improved races tomorrow morning Irish athlete Kieran McGean talking about the goal mile we also build up the Champions Cup weekend and we're talking about this week's football. OTBM will be live as ever from half past seven. The Club Championship show will be live here on OTB Sports from 10.30 so you can stay tuned to our channels right now. Let's hear from Matt Lawton who spoke to Joe last night about the mystery of Marcel Jacobs, the 100 metre sprinter who won gold for Italy at the Tokyo Olympics but hasn't run since. Now you're very welcome back to the show. So we want to turn to one of the more remarkable, intriguing stories of the year that has been. Go back to the start of the year. If you had asked anybody in athletics, who is going to take over from Usain Bolt? Who's going to be the men's 100 metres Olympic champion? Nobody would have said the name Marcel Jacobs representing Italy. Nobody would have said that name. At the start of this year, Marcel Jacobs had never broken the 10 second barrier over 100 metres. 
And then, of course, on August the 1st, this happened. The final of the men's 100 metres. This time they go. Sue was away quickly in the semi. He's not so quickly away this time. Alongside him is Curly. And Curly's going on. Look at the Italian Jacobs. And Jacobs has done it. What a surprise at these Olympic Games. 9.79. The fastest run of his life. And Italy are celebrating their second gold medal in less than five minutes. What a day for Italy. Le Mans. Marcel Jacobs. The Olympic Stadium is stunned. This man has come from nowhere. What a performance. Faster and faster. Well, it's rounded down to 9.80. That is a remarkable run. A truly remarkable run from Lamont Marcel Jacobs. And he won it in the end with daylight to spare. There you are. That was Eurosports commentary, by the way. Martin Gillian and calling the action. So August 1st, 9.80 seconds, Olympic champion out of nowhere. And he has disappeared from public competition just as quickly. Matt Lawton of the Sunday Times has been on the case, wrote a fantastic piece a couple of weeks back. And he joins us on the line now. Evening, Matt. Evening. Uh, we just thought this was worth following up on because I think uh, certain titles have that iconic standing in world sport. I mean, through the 20th century in particular, heavyweight world champion is one of those titles, maybe the World Cup champions, and certainly fastest man in the world, the 100 metres Olympic champion, has huge uh, prestige. So to have a shadow or suspicion of some kind hovering over this blue ribbon event is a disaster, actually, for the Olympic movement and the general uh, questions over its credibility. So uh, from nowhere... Marcel Jacobs, and uh, you decided, I presume for those reasons, Matt, to try and track him down. Well, it, it started during the Olympics. Um, I was at the stadium that night, and um, I, um, you know, I, I'd, I'd been at the 100-metre final, the previous two Olympic Games. I'd seen Bolt. I wasn't in Beijing, but I'd seen Bolt in 2012 and 2016. And and I, I responded to Jacobs winning, um, because he didn't even, he was third in the semi-final. Um, he didn't look like being the guy that was going to win it. And, and and I watched the final and I, I posted this tweet and I it simply said, um, uh, the new Olympic 100 metres champion only broke 10 seconds for the first time in May. Ah, oh, well. Now... <laughs> that caused a big response, not least in Italy, where people thought I was suggesting that he was a cheat. And I wasn't at all, actually. It, 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 far more was read into that tweet than, than, than I certainly intended. My only point was that, um, you know, this was a, as you said, the Blue Ribbon event at the Olympics. Well, I would, I would argue that in the 1,500 metres, men's 1,500 metres, uh, uh, and 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 women's 1500 meters, I should say. But I think those two distances are the kind of blue ribbon events on the track. Um, and um, obviously, arguably, the greatest sprinter in history had won the previous three uh, gold medals. And suddenly, it, it was a guy that had come from nowhere who had won it, and it was slightly underwhelming. Um, the sport was missing the fastest man in the world in Christian Coleman, who was obviously serving a doping ban for his missed, uh, his whereabouts failures. So I think he would have very much been the favourite. Um, and there was a bit of a vacuum and, and it, it was anybody's race, but but nobody saw that coming. Nobody saw uh, Marcel Jacobs winning that title. And he said that, he did, he did run three very good rounds. And um, yeah, despite having only run... I think coming into the Olympics, nine nine five, maybe nine nine four. I think he may have run. Yeah. Uh, then suddenly runs nine eight three or four in the semi, and then runs. Well, it, the clock stopped at nine seven nine, and the last time that happened in the Olympic hundred meter final was Ben Johnson in in uh, in Seoul in eighty eight. But the clock stopped at nine seven nine. It was rounded up to nine eight zero, new European record, and it was extraordinary. Now, what then happened after that? 
is I did indeed get a lot of abuse, particularly from my friends in Italy, um, and uh, who were sort of suggesting how dare I cast aspersions. As I say, that really wasn't the intention. It was more how underwhelmed I was by by the by the winner of the hundred meters. Um, but I then got contacted by somebody in Italy who had some documents, and they were police documents um, um, relevant to. Uh, an opera, uh, a police investigation in Milan, um, and, and and implicated in this investigation, it turned out, was this man who was all over the Italian press and had been for the previous 24 hours as the man behind um, uh, Jacobs' transformation, a guy called Giacomo Spazzini, who is a fitness trainer, um, I'll, come, uh, I'll come to him in a moment. I'll come to him in a moment. Yeah. That's where things do get very interesting. So to stay on Jacobs for just a second and uh, remind people of the situation. So 26 years of age, Italian mother. He has an El Paso-born uh, American Marine father. I mean, just to, again, labour a point, the extent to which this guy's an outsider, he's the only participant in the Olympic final who isn't being monitored by the Athletics Integrity Unit elite drug testing uh, pool. So he wasn't deemed, I suppose, worthy enough or enough of a, a winning threat to even monitor. Yeah. That's that's the extent to which he was not even on the radar of those in the know. Pre-2019, effectively, he's a long jump. Uh, I don't know if he's, he's long jump champion or not, but he's involved in, lo in long jump. And as you said, May of this year, he runs 9.95 seconds, breaks the 10-second barrier for the first time. It is just worth pointing out as well that post the Olympics, there have been several lucrative Diamond League meetings. He has dodged all of them. Sorry, dodged is... Um, <laughs> that sounds incriminating. He's, he's, he's cited mental exhaustion and has stayed away from competition since. Yeah. He hasn't run since. So, so, so I know that was a, I was very long-winded in explaining. So basically, I wrote a story about a police investigation during the Olympics. And, and then... And then after that, he didn't. Yeah, you know, he, he then followed. Obviously, followed the hundred meter title by being a member of the Italian quartet that won the gold, gold medal in the relay um, a few days later, um, uh, pipping the uh, the British quartet that <laughs> got their own drug testing problems. Um, and um, uh, and then, as 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 you just said, he then the announcement came out that he wasn't going to race anymore. There were five more diamond leagues. You can make a lot of money running in those diamond leagues. He was the new Olympic champion, but he, the, the announcement was made that he wasn't going to compete. So mm. the diamond league final, different events. There was one in Eugene, the, the, the sort of traditional ones in Europe, and he, he didn't show at any of them. Yeah. Within Italy, obviously, they're thrilled, as you might expect. So you mentioned in your piece in the Sunday Times, there's a mural outside his apartment. He's been pictured with Giorgio Armani in Dubai. There's talk of Strictly Come Dancing, the Italian version. Uh, his agent dismissed uh, reports of earnings of four or five million since his win. So um, let's jump in with your piece then, uh, the Stadio Paolo Rossi in Rome. And you arrive and a woman from the Athletics Federation in Italy says, that's Marcel Jacob's car. And then points you over to the track and, and she says, he's over there, you can watch, but stay off the track. And yeah. so you go and you watch and he's working with his uh, coach, Pelo uh, Camosi. I suppose in effect, you're, you're there, Matt, to ask for an interview. Initially, it seems like he's well disposed to doing that interview with you. He was friendly to start with, yes. Like, they, you know, look, they, they, when I got the call later on from one of his media team, they were a little bit miffed that I just turned up unannounced. But I made the point that the guy that I dealt with during the Olympics, um, who was his agent, just hadn't returned any calls, emails, no responses when I'd said, look, I'd like to go out to Italy and and see him. And there, there was no response. So I went out there and, and for the first couple of days with a, with, with, with a, with a colleague and, and we went out there basically with, with no appointments with anybody. Um, um, but we wanted to go and see the various people involved in this story. But yeah, I arrived at the stadium. Um, it, it is an official sort of training venue for the national team. So there were members of the, uh, there was security and there was, uh, well, I can't say it was pretty, pretty relaxed security. Um, and, and there was, a, 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 as, you, as you say, a, a lady from um, the Federation 
And they were actually very, very friendly and they were very relaxed. And, and they just said, yeah, you, know, you go and sit there, you can watch him train. And I did. I watched virtually his whole session. But then when I spoke to him, when he, so I waited for him to finish and he came off and he was very friendly and very charming and he, he clearly speaks good English uh, and his coach was very charming. But, uh, you know, and they initially agreed that they would, while he, he had to go, he had to shoot off to go to a, um, he was opening a new sort of store um, and uh, he, he had to dash off because it was quite a long way outside of Rome. I, I, I checked it out afterwards to make sure he was telling the truth. Uh, and um, uh, but they were they were initially receptive to the idea of meeting me the next day uh, and, and having a proper chat. However, I did I felt only, only right to say, look, just so you understand, I was the guy that wrote the piece about about this Milan police operation during the Olympics. And yeah, his face like you know his his face slightly dropped. He he, he suddenly looked a little bit less keen to speak to me and lo and behold a few hours later I was uh, I was told it wouldn't be happening yeah so that brings us on to uh, this nutritionist you mentioned uh, Giacomo Spazzini so he's I guess a nutritionist uh, promises uh, leaner stronger faster results he officially absolutely worked with Marcel Jacobs. He's uh, 30 years old, uh, bodybuilder, businessman. The police investigation you mentioned has been going since 2019 and they don't do subtlety when they name these investigations clearly over in Italy because it's called Operation Muscle Bound. And what they're looking into are allegations of fraud, of the use of drugs to alter athletic performance. And uh, I mean, business seems to be good. You mentioned as well in your piece in the Sunday Times, 2019, Turnover of this business. This isn't a guy working out of a suitcase. Uh, 1.2 million euro took his 12 staff on holiday to Ibiza to celebrate. He has 650 clients. Uh, you mentioned a revelation as well that his former business partner has just finished a four year ban for uh, doping. So, in effect, here, I think you doorstepped him, tried to get some answers from him. Uh, the, the claim here from the Marcel Jacobs side, and by the way, this is still an investigation into this guy, he hasn't been convicted or anything, but the claim from the Marcel Jacobs side is. We have not worked with this guy since March of this year, as soon as we realised that Operation Muscle Bound was a thing. That's that's the overview of their relationship at the moment, is it, Matt? Yeah, and that was that was very quickly their response in the summer during the games when I went to his agent. Now, all I would say to that is there it's certainly when on, on social media, when Spazzini was celebrating Jacobs's victory. Uh, in the 100 metres, it certainly wasn't being, their relationship wasn't being talked about in the past tense. It was like, this is the here and now, this is a product of what we've done, you know, this this is us, Team Jacobs. Um, however, um, once a British journalist started asking questions about that relationship, um, it was, it was, communicated to me that they had terminated their professional relationship in the March. Now that did coincide. It was, it was in March that he won the European indoors. Maybe at that point, um, uh, the Italian Federation said, you've got to stop working with this guy. They maintained it was when they found out about the, about the investigation. Now you've said just now this investigation has been going since 2019. It wasn't until March 2021 that uh, Jacob stopped working with him. But that that that's their that's their version of events. And, mm. and, and so-, so so one of the pertinent questions, if you ever do get an interview with Jacobs, uh, may well be if this Operation Muscle Band begin in 2019. How did you not find out about it until March of 2021? And he's entitled to give his answer uh, to that question. So look. We have to be um, fair, but I think we have to be uh, a touch cynical as well in this profession, not least when it comes to uh, this kind of a story. Uh, Jacobs maintains his innocence. This looks like a movie we've seen before and uh, not a particularly subtle one. So he will face uh, severe questioning. I note with interest that Jacobs camp are saying he's going to compete again in February of next year. There's um, uh, a meeting February next year ahead of the World Championships in Berlin. So uh, it's going to be interesting to see what reception he's, he, he receives there from uh, journalists, certainly, and, and I suppose to an extent, uh, fans. Yeah, um, 
I'm, I, would, I would imagine most journalists would be very nice and 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 polite, and because you do sometimes feel with these stories that you, you you're slightly on your own on these things. Um, no one else has really written about this. Um, no one really followed up what I did in the summer, um, and and no one's really followed up what I did in the Sunday Times a couple of weeks ago. Um, but you know, we have to. He, you know, he hasn't been. He hasn't tested positive. He hasn't been. Uh, accused of any of any wrongdoing um and you know it, it's really um at the moment the story is really that these are the people associated with him now they are all very confident that the police investigation will soon exonerate Fuzzini. there was supposed to be a hearing today um it's very difficult. I've been in contact with my sources in Italy today to try and ascertain if that happened. I was, it was suggested to me that it's been pushed back again until the new year. Um, but there was, it was interesting when I was in Rome that um, while they all claim that they don't speak to each other um, uh, anymore, there was a consistency. They all seem to know Spazzini up in uh, up near Milan and and Jacobs and his coach down in Rome. Well, I didn't speak to Jake specifically about it, but I spoke to Emosi, the coach, about it. And they all seem to be saying, telling me the same thing that in on December the fourteenth, Spazzini would be exonerated. Um, so uh, even though they don't speak to each other, they all seem to have the same information. Um, and it, it's you know, it's we have to remember a couple of things as well. Jacobs is a police officer, serving police officer in Italy. Um, it's, it is a police investigation. That makes it quite messy for Italy, I think. Um, and I thought what was really interesting, one of the most interesting aspects of, of what happened that day in Rome was that when, when um, uh, uh, I said to Jacobs, I'm sorry to turn up like this, but I have been trying to get hold of your guy and he's just not saying, oh, we've got a new media team. And then Camosi said, yeah, we've got a new media team. You'll get a call from Marco Ventura. And I said, all right, who's Marco Ventura? And he said, he's our new media boss. Now, Marco Ventura um, used to be the comms guy for the Italian president um, and is still involved very high government level was the as the communications director for the I think it's the head of the um crikey I'd have to check my notes but a very senior government official now what was really weird after that was that I then emailed uh, Marco Ventura um and he denied that he was working with um Jacobs so, right. and yet when I did then get a phone call from another member of Jacobs's media team, um, she initially said to me, um, you need to send an email request to myself and Marco Ventura. So work that one out. Um, mm. it, was, it was a slightly odd day. I uh, had a look to check. I wasn't sure if this may have been a particularly uh, low quality final. So uh, Jacobs won in 9.80 seconds flat. In 2016, Usain Bolt won with 9.81 seconds and then Bolt had his peak years of 9.63 and 9.69. And you go to pre-Bolt and they're slower times than Jacobs managed. So to his 9.80, in Athens it was 9.85, in Sydney it was 9.87. So this was uh, still a very respectable time that he won. Uh, this is a deeply unsatisfactory situation. Like, there's no two ways about it. There are too many questions here. Operation Muscle Bound raises all sorts of questions. Why the Jacobs camp didn't know that he was, that uh, Spazzini was under investigation. Uh, Jacobs' uh, profile coming from nowhere. The lack of testing of Jacobs in advance of the final. Was he a particularly prodigious, fast, uh, um, a, a long jump specialist that was just in the wrong pursuit? Well, clearly he was in the wrong pursuit, but was he especially fast in that pursuit? No, he wasn't very good at the long jump. If true, no, he was good. He's an eight meter plus jumper. Crikey, that's beyond the uh, beyond the physical ability of ninety nine point nine percent of the human population. But no, in terms of um, top class performance, no, a pretty ordinary long jumper uh, who has now become uh, a world beater uh, as a hundred meter runner. Um, and he, you look at his progression. There, I saw a very interesting graph. Um, that somebody did of the other guys in that final. And, and in terms of his progression, he's very much an outlier in the way that he has 
it from sort of you know from being a teenager that has has progressed um so look as i say he's not been accused of any wrongdoing uh, there is no evidence that he's doing anything wrong um we, we have to take him at his uh his word if you like but um i, I should say it was, it was actually the italian prime minister that ventura worked for it was berlusconi of course i just had a mental blank when we were when i was recalling it there um so yeah amazing yeah it, yeah as i say ventura denies he's working with him and yet his coach and his sort of full-time media woman say that ventura is working for him and you know for, for this guy is high level you know he now has quite clearly since he's become olympic champion you mentioned you know photographs with armani he's got some friends in high places um you know he is a star there yeah. and um and one of the points i made in the piece he's the only athlete that was allowed to park his car inside the stadium everyone else was outside the stadium one car was allowed in because he is the olympic 100 meter champion um but it is unsatisfactory because we don't like our athletes having these kind of associations you know it, it was it was you know the first sort of cuts uh that were that that that, 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 that were um that, that armstrong suffered were his associate was around his association with michaeli ferrari you know that that was that was very much where david walsh focused a lot of his early work was around ferrari and i think there are there are questions that need to be answered here about about association with these people well, look, you're one of the few who's written a piece on it, I think, which is, again, the extraordinary thing, given the profile of the title he now has, Marcel Jacobs. So, Matt Lawton of the uh, Sunday Times. Uh, piece is there, I'm sure, for people to still read online. Thanks so much, Matt. Appreciate it. Pleasure. OTB AM. With Gillette. Put your best face forward with our new and improved razors. Dad pod.